Howdy, folks, and welcome to the Podcast Iron. My name is Laura Mullen Vermilia, and on this podcast, I interview members of the Cast Iron Arts community in order to inspire, educate, and spread ideas about iron casting and cast iron art. Today on the show, we have John Poole. Now, John studied with Wayne Potratz at the University of Minnesota, and he went on to become the resident artist at an industrial foundry named Smith Foundry. In this conversation, he explains how the relationship formed and what the benefits were. John, thank you so much for this interview and for sharing so many insights into the industrial side of foundry work. This has been one of the most educational episodes that I've performed because you have informed me of so much factual information that you gained over your years of working in the field. The Podcast Iron Show is supported in part by individual supporters on Patreon. So thank you to everyone who has joined as a Patreon member to help me afford the production costs of this show. And I'd also like to thank our top supporters of the show, who are Sloss Metal Arts and the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance. The Western Cast Iron Art Alliance became a top supporter of the show back in February, and I'm so grateful. So let me tell you a little bit about them. They are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that consists of iron casting artists in the western states of the U.S. They were established in 2008, and their organization's goals are to educate, demonstrate, and exhibit cast iron art in the western region of the U.S., And one of the ways that they accomplish this goal is by organizing a conference every two years. Historically, a different board member hosts the conference, so it moves around from place to place. Start planning to come out west for their conference in the fall of 2024, and we've got plenty of time so you can put it on the calendar and put it out in the universe. And if you've only ever attended the national conference at Sloss, you got to get to the Western Conference. They are not the same. It's like comparing apples to oranges, my friend, and they both have their own style and distinct benefits. So obviously there's no solid dates this far in advance, but I'll keep you informed as things start to develop and the rumor that I'm spreading. But I just got it confirmed from a board member, so it's true. The 2024 Western Conference will be in San Diego, California. And I just want to point out that you don't have to live in the Western states to attend the Western Conference. So if you want to make the trip, they'll love to have you. A big thank you to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance and their board members for their support of this podcast and basically all of us in the community. For more information about this fantastic organization, visit their website, which is WCIAA.org. Our other top supporter is Sloss Metal Arts, which is a national center for iron casting and metal art. And I can't even believe it. It's already been a month since the national conference happened. And... Uh, I'm sure you know, but if you don't, Sloss Metal Arts hosts a national conference in Birmingham. It was such a well-done event, so hats off to everybody that were boots on the ground at Sloss and the NCCC IAP board for ensuring that everything went off without a hitch. So seriously, let's thank Sloss Metal Arts for sponsoring the show and also for hosting the national conference. For more information about the Sloss Metal Arts program, visit their website, which is slossmetalarts.com, and also follow them on Instagram at Sloss Metal Arts. And now, I talked about this a little bit during the last episode, but folks, now the clock starts again, the countdown to the 2025 National Conference. Let's go. Follow NCCCIAP on Instagram to keep up to date with developments, but start thinking about what you want to do. What do you want to contribute? Do you want to serve on the steering committee? Do you want to take the large mold workshop and get your hands on that big bull ladle? Do you want to do a performance piece or participate as a guest furnace or compete in the student cupola competition? I mean, everyone should at least enter the exhibition. So start making your piece. You've got two years. Well, more like a year and a half, but that's really not all that long. So your time starts now. Also, right now, Sloss Metal Arts are accepting applications for their summer youth apprenticeship program, and that's intended for high school students with living accommodations in the Birmingham area. But the deadline for that is May 20th, so like next Saturday. (laughs) 
Also, they're currently accepting applications for their fall visiting artist in residence program, and the deadline for that is August 25th. But all of this information for these opportunities is on their opportunity page of the website. So like I already said, check out their website, slossmetalarts.com, and share it with your friends and do all the things. So thank you, Sloss Metal Arts. And one more thing before we get into the interview, I want to mention an upcoming opportunity for the display of your large outdoor artwork. The city of O'Fallon, Missouri hosts a rotating sculpture series called The Shape of Community. And The Shape of Community is a citywide sculpture exhibition featuring large-scale works of art in prominent areas throughout the city, which are loaned by artists for about an 18-month period of time. Currently, there are 10 works installed, and you can see more details about them on the website, which for those of you who are watching the video version of this interview, you can see that I have the web address on the bottom of the screen, and also a link will be in the show notes and description boxes and all of the things. But if you're listening to the audio-only version, the easiest way to get onto the website is to Google The Shape of Community O'Fallon, Missouri. And when you visit their website, you'll see that the cast iron art community is very well represented in the group of 10 sculptures presently installed. And one noteworthy sculptor who has participated in The Shape of Community is our very own Kelly Ludeking. Kelly's sculpture is titled... In the room, and it is an elephant form, which is fabricated with farming equipment and other metal found objects. And this sculpture was in the 2020 through 2021 round of the exhibition program, and it ended up finding a permanent home at the O'Day Park in O'Fallon, Missouri. So see, a lot of artists from our community are participating in this rotating exhibition, and some of the sculptures even get purchased to remain in O'Fallon. Presently, we are a little less than one year out on the time frame of this call for submissions, and they'll be jurying your entries in early March of 2024. So start thinking about what piece from your catalog you want to apply with or even make a new piece for the deadline. You've got plenty of time. And if you have any detailed questions about this opportunity, please contact the Cultural Arts Coordinator, Martin Linson at M. Linson at ofallon.mo.us. And that's also in the description box if you need it to be sp spelt. This really is a great outlet for iron casting artists to showcase all the big heavy metal works we've been casting. So finally, let's get into the interview with John Poole. After much trial and error, John and I were not able to get his computer to work with the Zoom software. And we persisted by performing this interview over the telephone. This means that there is no video for this episode, and I apologize because I know that some of you really enjoy watching the video versions, but with the equipment that we had, this was the best that we could do, and I truly hope that it's good enough for you because it's a great interview where we cover some extremely interesting material. Also, stay tuned at the end of this episode to hear some news that I have about the podcast schedule. Never forget that this episode is brought to you by our top supporters, Sloss Metal Arts and the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and please enjoy. John Poole, thank you so much for joining us today and agreeing to be on the show. Well, it's a pleasure. I mean, like I, I saw, Wayne posted it on Facebook, his thing. And that was, you know, it's kind of interesting to hear Wayne's story go over there because, you know, we'll get into it, but I was a student of Wayne for several years. Um, but that's what sort of keyed my interest. And it's, it's great to see that you're talking to a lot of people that are, are working with cast iron. So it's, it's a good thing, especially the older folks like me and Wayne and you were talking to Steve Daly and stuff like that. And so just add a little bit to the knowledge and hopefully it'll help people with what they want to do with cast iron. Yeah. And I think that your story will help kind of flesh out the understanding of kind of some of the earlier years. So I'm really anticipating getting into that. But um, cool. let's start off with my very first question that I ask everybody every single time is, well, John, who the hell are you anyways? Well, I'm a person who kind of just, art was the only thing I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, falling in love with uh, cast iron. As, a, as many of us do. And then, and then, you know, that's where the story will kind of pick up is saying, okay, here, here's where I sort of saw it. I knew about it from, 
like my grandmother and stuff like that who worked in a foundry and um and when i i left one graduate school and i came to minneapolis and lived with her and i went down and i met wayne and the rest is history yeah all right well let's talk about a little bit of your childhood just you know um growing up did you have any memorable stories that you could tell us about like something that maybe you think played a part in who you've become today? Well, I sent you those pictures from my, from kindergarten that I made. Yeah. And even in kindergarten, I was always drawn to things and I never was a realistic type of drawer or sculptor, Mm -hmm. you know, which is how it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, when I look at some of the early stuff and things like that, but by the time I got to high school, um, I was never really interested in what was going on in school. And so my mom kind of looked at me and says, make sure you take an art class. Because that seems like the only thing you're interested in doing. And so even through high school, you know, I didn't get very good grades or anything like that. But I just started making art, making sculpture, you know, doing things out of clay and making a mold and making fiberglass molds. And I have some of those still hanging in my house here. Um, And I mean, the thing is, the whole pool kind of went there when my mom said, make sure you take art classes. Well, that was the only thing I was interested in doing. You know, and I tell people, art art is communication. And so, I mean, just like if you do a song, you write a book, you do a poem, you know, you do a play, you're, you're trying to convey something through a medium that communicates. And so that, you know, that's a, that's a hard goal to get to in art. Sit there and just sort of make something and just sit back and let people tell you what they see. And if they can't see anything that you're intending to do, it's time to scrap that one piece and try communicating it in a better way. So when you were in grade school, you mentioned something about clay and fiberglass, like what kind of, and drawing. So what did those early projects kind of look like? Well, they look, they, they, they looked like bad art for a long time. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they really did, but, you know, as I, I went on and did more and more things. Um, you know, I was into rock and roll and all that stuff, so I was, you know, doing photograph not photographs, but drawings of, you know, rock stars and mm-hmm. sculptures of, like, Deep Purple. I did Richie Blackboard, Ian Gillen um, from Deep Purple, and that was actually hanging on the wall about 10 feet from me. <laughs> <laughs> So they got better and better. And, and held up, I, yeah. I would I would sit there, you know, my friends would know when I was into one of my art periods because they'd call me and I'd say, no, I'm not coming out tonight. <laughs> but I did a picture of like Cat Stevens where it was like photorealism. And that's where I really started to figure out how to use a line on a piece of paper to make it say something. So, I mean, I didn't have a lot of formal training but I got, I got part of the craft taken care of because before you do anything in art, you got to learn the craft. You know, you can't be a good printmaker unless you understand the craft. Because once you understand the craft, then you can intentionally make a mistake to let that thing become part of your artwork. <laughs> or break the boundaries, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you break the boundaries when you know what the boundaries are. Yeah. <laughs> And then you can intentionally do that and you get somebody turn their head like a teacher will turn their head and they'll kind of look and they go, oh, okay, I understand where this is going. That's cool. Mm-hmm. But most of, the, most of the development took place for what I do these days in college, from undergrad at Drake to uh, the grad experience I had with Wayne. Okay. And that's where you hone it all down. Well, let's talk about, hold like, on though, but I want to kind of, so you went to. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all right. Oh, okay. Um, where you want to go. Uh, so from high school, <laughs> then you knew you wanted to go to college for art? Yeah. And it sounds like your mom was supportive of that. She was. Because she, she didn't know, she didn't know, you know, 
what the hell I was going to happen to me because that seemed to be the only thing I like to do. Yeah. So she's like, you know, it's like the parents shrugging the shoulders says, well, let's see what he can do. But I went to Drake down in Des Moines, Iowa okay. for undergraduate. Mm-hmm. And I had a teacher there, Doug Hendrickson, okay. uh, a sculpture professor down there. And he kind of took me, took me in. I had a good relationship with all the professors down at, at school. And that was the first time learning ever took off for me, you know, having to take a, a literature class and read all these books I had never read before. And like light bulbs are flying off in my head daily. And it was like, wow, this is the coolest stuff ever. And you're putting all this stuff together. But in undergrad, you know, you're getting in there, it's a little bit of education. So you're taking bits and pieces from all these classes and it, it teaches you how to think. Mm-hmm. So that started making my work even better and better. And the problem, Doug Henderson told me at the uh, second year, because I, I, I do all these pieces, and I would spend 15, 20 minutes telling everybody what they were about when you're getting together, you know, to discuss all your pieces with your class. Yeah. And one day I did this nice big piece that's on the wall, and I, he said, okay, John, you know, this is John's work here. And, I said, yeah, and, it, and, and he just puts his finger in the air and he goes, John, I'm going to give you some advice. He says, I want you to sit down and I want you to be quiet and listen to what other people are saying about it. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's that whole thing of, that's where the communication in making artwork, you know, that was the biggest light bulb that went off in my head. Is that I can tell anybody I want what my work is about. Mm-hmm. And it also dawned on me that a lot of kids, <laughs> students there would say something about her, their piece that didn't make any sense at all. And so if you sit back and you listen to what people are saying about what, what your work is, then you know whether once again, you are actually communicating. Or if you're communicating what you want well, to communicate. Right. Well, yeah. And that's what you say. This, my intention was boom, 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 but nobody sees that and that works. So I did something wrong. And that's where the whole development for me into what I do up until this day has kind of come from. When I do a series of work, and especially if it's different than the previous series, which I've had different styles throughout my career, is I always throw them in a wide array of people that I know from people who've never seen art before to professors, to everybody. And it gives me a general consensus that I'm on the right track. Great. Yeah. So then, so where? You, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, for years, I didn't even know, I forgot how to talk about my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> you, the pendulum swung all the way to the other side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really went hard. <laughs> <laughs> so... Did that happen in undergrad or did that happen later? I happened in undergrad. Okay. That's when I was at Drake. Right after Doug told me to be quiet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was it was really hard for me to to say it because I, I really did just listen to what people were telling me about what they saw that I made. Mm-hmm. And that let me start really focusing in. So I always tell a lot of times people, most people go into art school, an undergraduate. And I just go back to this whole phrase. It's a craft. You're learning a craft. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those undergrad shows look really good when you go see them. Then you go see a graduate show and people are tilting their heads and all this stuff because they're looking for, when you go to graduate school, you're looking to get your own voice. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And that, that the work that somebody says, say, Oh, that's a John pool. Mm-hmm. That's a so-and-so that's a so-and-so. Oh, there's another John pool. I mean, they, they, they start recognizing your style, your voice and how you're speaking through the material you're using. Mm-hmm. So when you were an undergrad, what kind of work were you making? I was doing a lot of drawings and I was doing a lot of stone carving. Okay. 
and putting things together. So there is a limestone quarry not too far from there. And you just go there and they charge you $10 for whatever you could get in your truck. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a resource yeah. right there. Uh, yeah. Because what it was is their, their pile of stuff they weren't going to use anyway. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they said, give me $10. You can help clear out the pile. Have all you want. Great. So I took that. Yeah, Indiana limestone, really good stuff to carve. So you said you were putting things together. So was it stone with other materials? Yeah, I didn't send you any pictures of that stuff. It was stone with, you know, found iron objects and steel objects and cables, uh-huh. uh, making making these pieces. There wasn't a lot of carving going on, but I would shape the surface on a lot of the pieces to get them to look a certain way and then just assemble sort of found object kind of a thing. Okay. Is that the work that you applied to grad school with? Yes. Okay. So tell me about that transition. Well, the first grad school I went to was Wash U, St. Louis. Okay. I didn't like it there (laughs) at all. Um, And so I spent one semester there. That's the one where you had to send all your artwork and everything else into. And then I ran into Doug after I left. And Doug just said, you're going to Minneapolis, right? He goes, yeah. He says, okay, well, if you're going to go back to grad school, I'm going to write you a note, and I want you to go talk to Wayne Pochatz. So he just wrote something down, down on a piece of paper, put it, put it in my wallet. and. Did you look at it? I didn't look at it, you no. Didn't look at it. You put it in your wallet and you didn't look at it. Okay. No. Because at that time, I was so down on my graduate experience, I never thought I'd go back. Yeah. But after a couple of years of being here in Minneapolis, I had my own studio doing things. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go check out the U, see what their department's like. And then I remembered Doug telling me about Wayne. So I walked into Wayne's office, which was a little steel cage at that time. It was in the older building. And can you tell me the university? This is University of? University of Minnesota, Minneapolis campus. Got it. And uh, I walked in. I introduced myself. And I said I was a student of uh, Doug Hendrickson. And Doug gave me a piece of paper to give you. I pulled out the paper from my wallet. Wayne opened it up. He started laughing. (laughs) And I said, what's so funny? And he showed me the piece, and he said, haven't you read this? I said, no. And he, and he showed me the piece of paper, and he said, John's a good guy. <laughs> and so I just sat there and I said, okay. And he said, well, come and take my class. Because I said, well, I just want to do some sculpture. And at that time, I still wasn't looking to go to grad school. Okay. So I spent a couple of years taking his class, and then he was doing, he was doing, he had the cupola at that time. And he would do that once once a year, and that was really kind of interesting and then Wayne just came up to me and said I need a grad student you're going to be my grad student all right so I didn't have to I didn't even have to fill out an application (laughs) yeah well it seems like you you know you had a letter of recommendation in that note Mm -hmm. and you also sounds like you earned it by just being around and participating and he must have liked you enough to want you to be full time. So what cupola was that one that you were first introduced to? Well, it was a 300 pounder. Okay. And at that time the foundry was in a inside a building, a big concrete building. Mm-hmm. And so they had a big furnace that they built there or chimney that the cupola would fit under. So they could actually do this all inside mm-hmm. and they had a crane so you could carry a 300 pound ladle and pour molds all over the floor and stuff like that. And Wayne, Wayne's, you know, his foundry was, it started doing some ceramic shells, but not a lot, but it was all sand. So just started learning how to make sand molds kind of on my own. Mm-hmm. And now that's that's the thing that I really started enjoying, and when you, when you saw the, the the iron floor, and even when they did bronze and aluminum to a, a a lesser extent, but 
I'd always call it the dance. Mm -hmm. Because when you're running a cupola, everybody's got to be in sync with what's happening. Yeah. There's a lot of timing issues and all kinds of stuff that go on, you know, and that's why they have all those things like mold captains. He's in charge of the tweers. She's in charge of this. Here's the different crews that are going to be charging the furnace, you know, boom, 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 all those sorts of things. So you got to be in concert with each other in this. And, and the motion is all the time. Mm -hmm. And that was real intriguing at that time. At that particular time, I got less intrigued with it uh, later on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So at this point, you're a grad student of Wayne's. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what kind of work were you making then? I was making... The first group I did and what I did for my thesis show was, and I call that series the dance series. And it was based in a, most of it was bronze. Vast majority of it was because iron was still, by the time I left there, they were only doing it twice a year. Okay. And it was hard to really get your teeth into it. But, um, so the work was trying to capture the mo the motion of the people involved in the poor in an abstract way. I didn't send you any of those pictures. I could have, but I didn't. I can if you want me to. Yeah, we'll get some in. And we'll... And so, but I mean, the biggest breakthrough, which really started to let me attack what iron could be, was when, I think Wayne went to Cliff Prokoff's school. I forgot where he taught. Because um, Cliff had a cupolette, and it's a batch melter. And commercial foundries use those to make sure they could understand what their iron was going to be like. Okay. So they had been around for a long, long time, but the advantage of it is, you know, technically two people can run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even have to break a sweat. Yeah. So once Wayne saw that, he got the plans from Cliff. Everybody got together who knew what was going on at, at Wayne's foundry, the students and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and fit it into a design that would work inside his foundry. So we did a test firing of it, things like that. And that's what really kind of actually gave me a, the ability to start thinking about what I'm making out of iron, what, what differentiates it from like a bronze casting. Because that's some of the things that I always look at when the things, because I'd get people call me, years later and say oh i want to do it in cast iron i go why do you want to do it in cast iron well bronze is too expensive yeah you know and i'd look at him i'd say well then i don't think it's a piece i want to cast you know there's you got to have a reason for me to help you make a piece in cast iron that deals with why cast iron but that's a little that's probably a little a uh, bit later on in the show <laughs> okay yeah we'll circle we'll uh revisit that because yeah, trying to answer the questions of what what really happened and didn't happen. I mean, all these things started happening where he brought in a cupolette. Mm -hmm. Then Wayne started talking with Tom Guy and Butch Jack, who came to all the iron pours, and a lot of the other professors that had come and visited and they all know each other that did some iron work started to put together sloths. Yeah. Which really kind of, that was the real sort of, beginning of the explosion of mm -hmm. people doing cast iron in all these schools. Okay. So do you, what year about? Oh okay, God, it's got to be between 82 and 84. Okay. Yeah. And so at that point, besides Wayne, who else do you know had iron in like the art, I guess we should say in the art or academic arena? Well, I know Cliff okay. did it, um, you know, and I know Butch Jack did it down in Beaumont, Texas. Um, and there were just, there were other people that came there, but I hadn't really, I personally didn't go anywhere or, and I personally don't remember hearing about a 
who else was really doing it. And you can't know every, like, you might not know everybody, but I'm just, I'm like, I definitely don't know. Yeah. And so I'm just trying to like <laughs> pull as much information, like from the early, you know, cause this is the time before the SLOSS conference. I mean, somebody like Jay Hooley, Jay Hooley was doing it. Okay. So they, I, did they, I feel like I've sat in on an artist talk where Wayne and Tom talked about visiting different sites to see what site they wanted to have the conference at. Mm hmm Yeah. Right. And they came on, they came upon a, a sloss. Okay. And so then they put together, you know, I was part of the steering committee, you know, and one of the things that, that I had been to other conferences and they're just so expensive, right? They're still in the planning for all this. And Jim Schwartz, who taught in Marshall, Minnesota, part of the University of Minnesota out there, um, he always talked about stories of going to the old conferences where, you know, the beer was five cents, <laughs> you know, everybody goes to the bar and that's where they have a lot of their meetings and they talk about what they're doing in their fields and, exchanging information and stuff like that. And he said, one day I just, you know, I ordered a beer, came at the bar and I looked beside me and there was Noguchi. Yeah. yeah. You know, where would you, this famous guy wanted to come and see what this art conference was about. Mm -hmm. And Jim talked about how inexpensive it was. And so me and Jim started talking about, we got to find a way to make this affordable for the students because the teachers, the school is paying for everything. Mm -hmm. But as a student, you're on a tight budget. Oh, yeah. So that's what we got, you know, like the, you said, the campground there. Mm -hmm. You know, we found a hotel that was really affordable for everybody to stay at. And they gave us special rates and things of that particular nature when, when we actually did the conference. Mm -hmm. But as far as all the nuts and bolts of putting all the pieces together, that was Wayne and the, and the professors that were really doing all that work. Okay. I just got to be a small part, say, you know, put my hand up and say, I just have one thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> so you were at the very first conference at yes. Slash for the cast iron yes. art. Um, and do you know what year that was? Uh, I if you don't, it. it's okay. I'm, I mean, we can probably, it's in the records. I can look it up. Um, I just haven't yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably 84. Okay. Could be. Yeah. Probably 84 in the eighties, mid eighties. Okay. Yeah. In the eighties. Might've been as late as 86. The first one okay. down there. What do you remember about it? Like specific details. And so did everybody bring their furnaces? Oh, there was, there was several furnaces that were brought. Mm -hmm. And so that's when people started dividing up into groups, which I didn't like at all. <laughs> what do you mean by that, because, dividing up into groups? Well, they were, they were loyal to this teacher, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that other teacher and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and they'd all talk about, you know, they'd be all so proud of, well, my leathers are cooler than your leathers type of thing sort of happening where you get these, this tribal mentality happening down there. And with Wayne's furnace, it was a cupolette. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't particularly interested in having to sit around and run it all day. <laughs> so yeah. I just, you know, I just looked at Wayne and says, I'm going to go to so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. -so. You got a problem with that? He says, no, just let's get the first two taps out and you're free to go. <laughs> and, and so that's where I started meeting a lot of these different individuals and the teachers and things like that where you got to know things mm -hmm. you know and god it was the first or second one that butch jack bought a garbage can furnace okay you know, made from made from a garbage can you can get at the hardware store yeah <laughs> and I, I told butch i said i want to run that with you <laughs> this is the strangest thing i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and it worked really well so did he line it with anything specific? The same refractory, same refractory you would use in any furnace. Okay. Yeah. And then he had little steel pails, you know, with a steel handle on it, you know, probably held 
a gallon, maybe a gallon and a half. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what we would put the iron in. You just take the tail over to a little mold and pour <laughs> it. Do you remember what? Well, really, I should be asking him. I have plans in in it's me interviewing Butch is in the works, definitely. Yeah, you got to ask so, him about that. I'll ask him about that because I want to know about like if there was a wind box. I want to know about the blower system. I want to know about how much it. So I'll ask him all of those details. Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, a furnace, it's a mathematical formula. <laughs> so, I mean, the size of the iron, the size of the coke is matched up to the size of the well. Okay. Yeah. And so you just go from there. You can never give it enough air. You know, mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's the one thing I, I've always learned is if you're having problems getting hot iron out, get more air into it and it should solve your problem. Okay. And it usually does. Mm-hmm. I did see a lot of different things, but I, I didn't see anything that opened up any more avenues to saying, hey, I can incorporate that in my work. You know, I, I thought that, you know, from what I saw from the people down there, I said, well, they don't make very good molds. <laughs> or eh, that's a little shabby type of thing with how they were actually put together. But a lot of these groups that had their furnaces were pretty much new to cast iron to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I'm not trying to be judgmental on them so much as it's like going, I had it really good with Wayne. Yeah, and you got to realize that when you saw kind of what everybody else was working with? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how long were you in the, because so at that point, were they having them already every two years or? No, the next one was like, I think it was four years before we did the next one. Oh. Okay. Because there was interest in it. Yeah. But putting all the nuts and bolts back together with Wayne and Tom and stuff like that, I think, you know, they felt, and I think it was four years later, but Potrats or Butch Jack can tell you exactly how yeah. long yeah. it was. Um, the difference in between the first and the second. And then even after that, it wasn't, I don't think even at that time, it was thought about, well, when are we going to do third one and they said well you know it might take another four years or something like that to get that much interest but eventually it turned into this every two years thing yeah were there exhibitions at the early ones of artwork yeah okay yeah it was small but i mean it was there i mean the thing has grown exponentially and iron has grown exponentially in and of itself and what people did, but as that kept growing, I sort of went in a different direction because my concern was if I like iron, I got to start making better stuff out of it and I got to find better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. So where were you in your grad kind of trajectory at that point? Was that kind of in the middle? Like, it sounds like well, you were working, taking classes and working as a sculptor with Wayne before. So I'm not exactly sure where, you know, how long were you helping him kind of with these conferences? Well, I mean, I was on the steering committee for the first one. Okay. And I said, my, my amount of help was let's find a reasonable price to get the students to go there so it doesn't break them. Yeah. But then the, the the thing with the help was, is we just kept refining and refining different things with the pour, how you make sand, what kind of different molds can be made, that type of stuff. Those are the things I was just down to the nitty gritty on different stuff. And Wayne, Wayne and Tom, you know, they were the head of it all. So they put it together because, you know, a lot of teachers would say, I've used up all my funding this year, so I could, I'll, I'll put it in my budget for next year take my students and things like that. So they were working on all those types of logistics to get the thing back up and running again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, Wayne always had, you know, always invited guests every year and that became the big event. I mean, you know, there'd be 200 people just showing up to watch the iron pour when we had it. Mm -hmm. And it was usually his biggest class. And the nice thing about Wayne's class is that, Sometimes the women outnumbered the men's students. Yeah. So it was one of those things. And in those days, you know, 
I think there was one woman teacher in the art department, and there wasn't always a lot of nice things some of the other professors said about her. <laughs> mm, yeah. And you're kind of going, well, what is all this about? But I mean, that's what started opening up a lot of different avenues, especially for women, you know, and, and Wayne was always very good and very inclusive to have anybody, no matter who they were, take his class. Yeah. After all, he let me do it. <laughs> and I think that it shows because it definitely, you know, his influence on this movement and the students that came out of his programs far and wide. Yeah, yeah. And that's just because I, it, it was it was well run. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a, a chore. It was always, everything was always nice. You know, and sometimes, you know, no egos involved, anything like that. You know, back in the day, like in the 80s and even before that, a lot of teachers had a lot of egos. Mm, okay. And then you'd meet their students and they say, yeah, well, you know, his ego says, tells us that we have to do it this way or his this way. And they would have different things that they would, you know, poo-poo about what teacher would do from time to time. But, you know the positive things they were getting out of it outweighed the negative. But at that time, at that time, one of the people that Wayne brought in mm -hmm. for the annual poor was a guy named Norman Taylor. Now he taught out at, um, Washington university, uh, Seattle. And he came in because he was doing that CO2 gas. He put it in, Harden up the sand and things like that. Oh, sodium silic is it sodium silic silicate? Yeah, I forgot I forgot the stuff in the bottle that hardens the sand up. Yeah, I've but seen it hardens, that happen. It hardens sodium, yeah, it hardens sodium silicate up. It's right. Yeah, and I feel like it's a core thing that the industry would use for cores. Well, all the sand that hardens up is core sand. Yeah, any sand that hardens up, but those molds. Very few foundry make molds out of that stuff. They all make cores out of it. Okay. And they, they use green sand. They incorporate that, and they have all these huge machines and things like that that make this stuff. But he came in with the gas cylinders, and so first night he was there, it's like he introduced himself, says, hey, I said, I'm interested in seeing what this is all about. And so I helped him make, like, 10 molds in two hours. Oh, wow. And these are, yeah, decent-sized molds. And so we got to talking and doing things while he was there. And then he had talked about going to Kohler. And he talked to Wayne about it and stuff like that and said, Wayne, Wayne kind of goes, yeah, I'll go with you if I can. And well, you, when you, when you say go to Kohler, do you mean to visit? Uh, to work, to make artwork inside the foundry. Okay. Now Kohler, Kohler, that's why it says KK on the toilet, but it's by Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Okay. So how did he start that? Do you know how he started that conversation with Kohler? Yes, he had been writing them and putting applications in for a few years. And he was always getting no, um, you know, we had had an artist that tried to do it. It didn't work out well. Uh, we're just sticking with our ceramic stuff where they make the toilets and the urinals and things of that particular nature. Did they have ceramic artists doing residencies at the time? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that, that program was already up and running. Okay. But, and he had been writing to try and get in for cast iron. Yes. And somehow, about a year and a half later, I think it was about a year and a half after he was at, at uh, the U at, in Minnesota here, he, he called Wayne, he called Tom, he called everybody and says, hey, Kohler says I can come and I can bring one person with me. Well, none of those guys had time in their schedule to do it. And so Norm calls me and says, hey, so uh, how about you? You're really good. And I said, yeah, I'll go with you. All right. So that's one of those paths that take you from like doing a drawing to going to an undergraduate school learning the tricks of the trade, to going to grad school. And that path goes from just making things to, I love cast irons. Let's go ahead and go here. Yeah. And so 
we went there in the summer and um, our job was to prove that artists could exist inside a foundry without messing it up. All right. Tell me all about it. Yeah. Yeah. Write the rules of the road for the artists. So we went around, selected a place where we could set up a studio that was out of the way of the workers. You know, what time to pour, what time could we use the sand machine, you know, what the different types of metals they were coming out with were, you know, and then just test our skills. Mm -hmm. And we did it. And it, I think, you know, last time I checked, it was their most popular art program there. Yeah. And so that's where I started learning what an industrial foundry could do, which was tremendous. Like they have a ribbon mixer, which is the machine that mixes up the sand and puts it in your mold. And, uh, you know, you hit the button and the sand comes out as much as you want and you hit the stop button and it stops. <laughs> so you could do 10,000 pounds if you wanted to do it. And how is the ramming of 10,000 if you wanted 10,000 pounds? Like, how do how does that? You just you just ram it the, the normal way that you would ram a sand mold. Like with, by hand. Okay. Yeah. You don't have to do it very hard or anything like that because it sets up. But so that turned me on to the whole process is that now I can do as much as I want. And so we took a break after being there for a month. We went home for a week and I got home and I went directly over to the Wayne's Foundry because I was still his grad student at that time. And I just, I just started mapping out these huge pieces. I'd draw them on the floor and cut wood and get all the different things to put together my forms. And so when I came back, I was loaded to bear. <laughs> so how many months did you end up? We were there for three months. Three months. And so when I came back, uh, I found this place called Scott Atwater Foundry, which is about four miles from the university. Actually, it was like two miles from my house. Okay. And I walked in there and I met the owner, Scott Atwater, and I told him what I had been doing. I brought all my photos from, from Kohler. And he says, great. Why don't you meet me at this restaurant tomorrow at noon? And you can show me what you got. And so I said, okay. So I met him there and he always had a bowl of soup and crackers. That's what he had for lunch. Okay. <laughs> and I showed him all my stuff and he goes, oh, this is great. Oh, so you know about the ribbon mixers and you've been doing this. And, and oh, oh, yeah, here's a picture of you with the furnaces. Yeah, those are nice big furnaces. Oh, and tell says, me so a little bit about the Kohler furnaces. Sorry to backtrack, but we didn't even talk oh. about that. Well, at that time they had three 40-ton uh, furnaces. 30 ton furnaces and one was always being relined and then they had two they had two 40 ton rollover furnaces which are holding furnaces which keep the metal up to temperature okay and what type of furnaces are they induction induction okay at that time they were required by the u.s government to maintain their old cupola furnaces, which there was like six of them in working condition in case we went to war. Wow. Okay. So they had to maintain them even though they didn't use them. And they took up a lot of room inside that place. And what kind but, of furnaces were those? Coke blast furnaces? Yeah. Giant cupolas. I've heard other people talk about whitings. Was it kind of like that style? Whiting is a brand name. Okay. And whiting would be, you know, I think they did stuff. You could do bronze with those things too. Mm. Uh, they made different kinds of furnaces, but that was just one of the, like Inductotherm is another company who makes induction furnaces, but there's several companies that make them. You know, the largest one I've ever heard of is there's a hundred ton one, I think in California. Whoa. Yeah. hundred ton furnace. Whew. Yeah. That is big. But when I was with Alex from the guy from that owned Atwater, when I went to lunch, I showed him all these things. He says, so what do you want to do? <laughs> I said, well, I want to bring, you know, some pieces in and see if you cast them. And he goes, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. And I said, great. So I brought pieces to him occasionally, stuff like that, big pieces. And they pour the metal in and I put it back on my truck and I go down to the U, knock it out and start working on these things. 
So you would make the sand molds and show up with them ready to pour? Yes. Okay. All right. And then it came a time where, you know, my time with the, the U was coming to an end. Mm-hmm. And so I went back over there and he, he said, once again, let's go to lunch. <laughs> and I went through everything that I was doing. And he says, well, you can't. You, he goes, do you have a million dollars? I said, no, but I'm looking to continue my artwork. Yeah. And at that time, about a year before that, the foundries went on strike. And he was still pretty pissed off at his employees. <laughs> so yeah. he kind of goes, I'll make you a deal. You do two hours of lab work for me a day, and I'll give you a studio space, and it's going to be free of charge. Wow. I said, okay. Mm-hmm. So I started in with them. But a year later, he was trying to sell the place to the employees. That didn't work out. Nobody else wanted to buy it. And he was wanted to retire, so he closed the place down. Okay. What um can I just ask you what type of lab because you said two hours of lab work. What does that mean? Well, you take samples uh from the furnace and from the ladles. You would go into the lab, you would test the samples to see what the percentage of ingredients were inside of them. Okay. And then there was a chart that said they have to be within this range because they had to prove to their customers they were actually giving them what the customer ordered. Like different types of? Different types of iron, cast iron. Okay. You know, there's ductile iron, there's gray iron. You know, gray iron, there's like four different types of gray iron. There's five different types of ductile iron. They have different, like a Brunel is, is a reading of hardness. Mm-hmm. And it's with a little dimple on the iron and it tells you this. And then you look at the chart and it says it's with intolerance of what the company ordered. So if anything would happen to that piece, the founder could prove that they, they gave the customer what they ordered. And so if, if the piece happened to break, it wasn't their fault because we don't, we're not the engineers. We just give them the product. Got it. So you're filling the order with what they asked, but you're not the engineers. Okay. Right. And I'm just doing the lab work to prove that all this goes in. And then you got another little thing you pour some metal into that you shine up and you put under a microscope and you can look at how, and this is for ductile, all the little circles, the black circles. And that tells you what type of ductile iron you have also. So they had different things to prove that, yes, this is what we poured. This is the day we poured it. Here's the type of metal. It was poured on tap 13, those sorts of things. Okay. All right. Thank you for those. So it's kind of laborious, but it, it's one of those things that really lets you know. It's like, you know, I didn't know there was all these different types of iron. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated right now. I'm like, tell me mm-hmm. everything that you want to tell me, you know. So yeah. um, who was kind of mixing those in the in the furnace as it were you know like who was there a person in charge of oh we're going to put a little bit of this in and a little bit of that and right there was a head the head guy in the lab okay who, who also supervised the rest of the foundry but they had a thing called meonite and that's a company who licenses the formula their formula for ductile iron Mm-hmm. And and they supply you all the stuff you need to make your iron do what it needs to do. All the additives, yeah. Yeah, and okay. so then then the person running the furnace would measure out, you know, right down to the ounce, this material, that material, this material, that material, and then they dump it in the furnace. So the non duct the not the ductile additives but the other stuff the other components of the iron where were you got or where was that foundry sourcing this original iron material from with the regular iron they would order ingots okay and those ingots would come in and then they boom they use the returns which is like the gating systems or a bad casting or things like that to get the right mix of iron inside the furnace then they sourced steel because they also, to make cast iron, 
use a certain amount of steel inside the iron, which changes the carbon density and all the other stuff. And the reason you can control the iron and make different types is because you're not using coke. Coke makes high phos iron. High phos iron is like that Kohler uses high phos iron to make their bathtubs because it's very fluid. And so you can make a thin walled uh, bathtub that's really big and not have it, you know, cold shots and things like that in it. I can imagine a bathtub is something that's quite difficult to cast. Yeah, they had an automatic, they had an automatic pouring station at Kohler and the ladle would go in. It'd fill up exactly how much metal they needed for the certain bathtub they were doing. Thing would come out automatically and have four spouts on it and four cups in the mold. And the thing would just go boom. And 200 pounds of metal just came out. <laughs> and it'd go back in. It made a bathtub every 26 seconds. Holy cow. That's amazing. Crazy. It is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, so we're talking, we're, let's get back to he closed down the foundry. Yeah. So he's closing down the foundry. Unless there's and, anything else that you want to tell me about this lab work and all this. Well, I did more lab work when I, when I went to Smith. Okay. So we'll talk about that then. So, I mean, that okay. kind of continues because Alex was pretty primitive. Okay. Although effective in the way they did their labs. Um, Smith was much more sophisticated in the equipment and stuff that they used over there. But I asked Alex, I said, you know, I've been to like five different foundries and none of them seem to be places I can work in or they won't talk to me and stuff like that. And he said, did you call Smith Foundry? I said, yeah, but they hung up the phone on me. Oh. Says, I called Tim Hardigan. Don't tell him you're an artist. Mm, okay. So I called this Tim Hardigan. And at that time he was their metallurgist. Mm-hmm. And I said, hi, I introduced myself, told him that I was at Atwater and they're closing down. I'm looking for a place. And he says, why don't you come over today? <laughs> I said, all right. And he, says, and he said the same thing. Don't tell anybody you're an artist. I said, all right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cause, and that's where I always learn to tell people when you walk into a company and want something from the company that can help you, never introduce yourself as an artist. That's it. Oh, that we can circle. But that, that sounds like <laughs> good advice. Mm -hmm. It's so, very uh, good advice because it, it, it opens doors that would automatically be closed. You say the word artist in a blue collar plant and, you know, get the hell out of my place. Mm -hmm. So I went over and I met with Tim and Tim says, this sounds like a really good idea. Here's how I'm going to propose this because you're an artist. He says, we're going to do something that I've always wanted to do. And it's called iron in the light. I'm going to do neon with cast iron. I said, great. And we're going we're gonna to invite schools in here. And we're going to host a competition. He says, let me clear this with the owner. Because I, he said, I've talked to him about this before. And he says, we don't have time to do it. Blah, 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 blah. And so two days later, Tim calls me back. And he says, okay, I think I got a deal for you. He said, I want, and he said, I only want one hour worth of lab work. Okay. You can have a studio space. You have to clear or find your own space out there to work in. Um, and we're going to, and the iron and light show is on. I said, great. What else do you want me to do? He says, I want you to go talk to Potrats. And I want you to go talk to MCAD. We're going to invite students to bring molds here to pour. And then we're going to, we're going to, they, rented a gallery space in the gallery part of town here to show off all the artwork. They had judges, all these sorts of things. It was really kind of cool. And so as I coordinated all that stuff, the old, the old guard that worked at the foundry wasn't happy. First of all, that an artist was hanging around their foundry. Mm -hmm. Then when I started bringing the students in, they were even more pissed off. And so one day I get a call from uh, Neil Alstrom, owned the foundry, and he wanted to see me in his office. So I went into his office and said, John, this just isn't working out. And I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, the guys are complaining and stuff like this and that. And he says, 
you know, after we get done with this contest, you know, maybe you can just make molds in your garage and bring it down here and I'll pour them for you. And I said, that's unacceptable. And I said, all right, I'll have my stuff out of here by the end of tomorrow. Go ahead, have fun finishing off the uh, students' artwork and doing your art show. Okay. And so I started clearing stuff out of the boundary that I had brought in there. Mm -hmm. And Neil calls me back in the office. He says, give me 24 hours. Meet me here tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. I said, all right. And I came back in the next day at 3. Neil was 15 minutes late. He came in his office and says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I talked to every single one of my employees. And I asked them specific questions about you, what they thought of you, were they okay with you? And every one of them gave you a thumbs up. Says, so I was wrong to ask you to leave this foundry. So here's what I'm going to do, John. We're going to finish the show, and then you don't have to do any more lab work for me. Studio is yours. Do with it as you please. You don't owe me a dime. So he gave me a $50 million studio free of charge. And I stayed there for 35 years until they sold the place. Unbelievable. That's an amazing story. Uh huh. And so in that period of time, it was, it was a great thing where I'd have, you know, Wayne would bring his students down. Other folks would bring their students down. I think I sent you a picture. Julia Schmidt came and paid me a visit one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would do things with students. I would do things for local artists. I'd do things for artists that lived out of town that they wanted something out of iron and they couldn't do it and that type of stuff and did my own work. And my schedule was my schedule. And it was just, it was like the greatest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> that happened to me. And then it, it continued to open even more doors to other businesses things like that. Uh, advertising agencies started calling me to do things. I got a thing for BMW for their five years with this big ad firm here in town. Mm -hmm. and they paid me $12,000 to make six five inch high pieces of cast iron. It was in the shape of the letter five. And I asked him the question, why cast iron? He says, BMW pays us a lot of money. We don't want to give them bronze thinking that we're wasting their money. If we give them cast iron, they'll think, oh, well, at least you're being careful with our money. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's cool, huh? That's an interesting concept. Yeah. And then I had another thing where I ended up doing it in bronze, but because I had the foundry or use of the foundry, uh, another person that was working with Target called me up and says, hey, you know, we're doing this thing for Hispanic Teacher of the Year in California. I've got this artist who designed the thing. Could you put it in bronze for us? I said, yeah. And then I hooked up with this other foundry called Anorog Foundry. that's Stillwater, which is an eastern suburb of Minneapolis. Um, and started working on different kinds of projects with them. So these are the things that kept, because I kept pushing my techniques to how to make all this different stuff. And it opened even more doors as to how I was even going to approach my own artwork. So I kind of buried myself in this world. And how were these companies knowing to contact you for these jobs? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah, I never advertised because if I'd advertise, I'd get 20 farmers a day calling me to fix a plow. <laughs> I will tell you, um, I get. Not as much as when I first started, but uh, so I post some videos on YouTube of the iron casting and there'll be people sending me emails um, asking me like to fix or make embarrassing cast iron thing that's broken. Can you replicate it? And um, they'll always, not always, but sometimes I'll get like a, my budget is $60. <laughs> right, right, right. And I'll be like, I'm really sorry. I don't have the bandwidth to do that right now. <laughs> I just tell people I'm $250 an hour mm. plus yeah. materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's my rate for advertising companies. Mm -hmm. You make a, you can make a, if an advertising agency comes to you as an artist and wants you to be involved in the product, quadruple, whatever you think, thinking about charging them. Because 
they charge enormous, gigantic amounts of money to do a project. They charge their clients. And so that, yes. Right? Okay. Boatloads and boatloads of money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tell me some of the other ones that you, an interesting, or you sent me one photo of, let me pull it up. It's like a small vessel. Um, engineers at the U of M wanted you to, to do a copy of the Lynn pot. The Lynn pot is considered to be the first cast iron pot made in America. And they were pulling off some shenanigans, but the governor and everybody was going to come down and see this thing and what they were doing with taconite. Taconite is something they make here in Minnesota that they use in steel. And because They've used up enough of the iron. They have to do a special way of getting the iron out of the rock now. And so they had they had developed some thing that was going to pour iron out of their, their furnace and stuff like that. So I made like 20 molds of that pot. And I think the one I sent, you know, I gotta, I'm trying to go down this list here. Oh, no, it's decorated. So that's when I, I, had, I had a few extra molds let up over and I started decorating them. Okay, so that's... But um, on your post, there's a more plain one. Yeah, but I know I have a plain. I have a couple of plain ones still left mm-hmm. over here, and a couple of decorated mm-hmm. ones that I did. So, did that. you make a mold of the original vessel? No. Okay. No, they. I just looked at the picture, and I made. It was a wood pattern. Okay. That I did it out of. And the original pot had a handle on it and had a top on it, stuff like that. They just wanted it to not, you know, they just wanted to keep it simple so they could afford doing it. One of those things, could we, uh, what if we pay $50 a piece? Well, then I don't do the handle and I don't do the top. Okay, we'll do $50 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. I mean, sometimes with these commissions, you kind of have to find a middle ground because the customer doesn't always know what things are worth, I feel like. Well, they don't. And, and a lot of times too, when people call me, to, they wanted me to do some iron and stuff like that. And they'd say, well, it's cheaper than bronze. I said, you really, the material is different, but the labor is the same. And the majority of my bid to do this piece is labor cost. Yeah. You know, the iron is, you know, and I always say the iron is about $3 a pound, even though it was 25 cents a pound. But, uh, and sometimes that would change their mind to sit there and say, okay, let's do, you know, do some bronze. And then I'd send it to an appropriate foundry that could help them do the bronze. So what were you making for your own, your own, utilizing the studio for your own art means? What kind of work were you making? Well, I sent you some big chunky stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that was kind of early on and that was all done out of styrofoam and all piece molded. Uh, work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I would ask myself the same question. Could this be bronze? Could it be another material? And I said, well, they look good enough to be iron. I don't think it, because they were solid. I mean, these are very heavy pieces. They weren't all that big. Um, But, you know, you got a piece that's, you know, 20 inches high and it weighs 100 pounds. (laughs) But then, the last work I did is like last night I sent you a few different pictures of it. I sent one picture earlier of it, but I combined everything. Like if you go to the bottom of the the stuff I sent you. Mm-hmm. But the idea was to take what I did, and, and I think the tallest of these pieces is like sixteen inches tall. They're eighth of an inch thick, and they're all cast iron. So it it kind of kind of. It's one of those things where you feel like you've circled around from the beginning of when I saw iron and I call it the dance where everything's working in consort with each other. And these pieces are stronger as a work together than they are as a single piece. And it makes way more of a statement because when I did show these to people in the groupings, you know, I got all the right answers. It wasn't one person got a little bit of this or two people got that or one person got three things I was talking about. They were able to do, they were able to come back to me with a narrative that was spot on with what I was doing. Because 
it's not only telling one rigid story, it's telling us a fluid story that can take you into different spaces and different places inside your head. So that's what I really liked. And I said, I think I finally did something out of iron that I think is it, it deserves to be made out of this material. Whereas before I was satisfied with it, but I still thought I was lacking something in my work. Even though, you know, people liked it and they always knew it. So that's, I can tell that's one of yours, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's, somebody says that to you, you're kind of going, well, I don't know if that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I think in your case, I mean, I think that they're very striking and, and, you know, kind of mind bending in, um, they're so thin. They kind of make me a little nervous. Right. And you could, and you can actually flex these things. No, these are cast iron. I, I know. Boundary iron. I, that's wild that they have flex that that's terrifying to me. But yeah, it's, I know because anything that comes out of a cupola that's this thin, just breathing on it, it's going to fall apart. Yeah. But these, since these were induction cast. No, these are gray iron. Oh, okay. But they're not high. They're not high foss iron. They're, it's, it, it's, it's all engineered. Once again, you know, they have an induction furnace at Smith's. It's an eight ton furnace. And they got a great lab. They got spectrographs and all kinds of different things to make sure everything is right. And I always tell people with a gray iron, you can bend it a quarter of an inch. That's wild. Before it breaks. You can't bend it back. <laughs> but these things are thin enough that you could, if they're two inches apart and 10 inches tall, eighth inch thick, you can actually touch the top parts of the pieces together and they return to their original position. Wild. That's how much flex is in there. You know, if you go, if you try to bend it more than an inch and a half, it's probably going to snap. <laughs> okay. But still, with your experience and a lot of other people's experience with cast iron, it, you know, you just, some people say, I don't believe you. <laughs> Well, I mean, I be I believe you because I choose yeah. to. I totally choose to. But um, I, like because it's just my experience is different, and so I guess that leads a question. Um, le that leads me to have a question about: Do you feel like something is missing because you're not pouring with a cupola? No, I don't. I don't miss the days of running furnaces. Okay. Um. I'd seen, for myself, I was satisfied. I'd seen everything I thought it could do. Like I told you, like George Beasley was at the first conference, and his performance piece was spectacular. And I, once I saw, saw, you know, and I saw how long it took him to put this whole thing together, how hard he worked with the students and all this other stuff. But it was just mind-blowingly cool what happened with that piece. And I don't know if I was standing next to Wayne or not, but I was standing next to somebody, and I turned to him. I said, nobody is ever going to be able to top this. And from all the fire performances I've seen, none of them have come close to what George perceived to have done in my mind. Now, that's just my own personal opinion. Because the reason why I ask you about, you know, coke versus induction is because I do feel like to some people um the running of the coke furnace is really important to them and their love for this material and oh it absolutely is I mean that's why you said you went to that thing they called the tribe meeting or whatever it was but you know you know and, and people people love that um, movement and everybody's kind of got a job to do at one time or the other. And it is, it's like, you're all doing a little dance together. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you made your graduate school, you great made your graduate work about stuff that. That's right. Because that's what I saw. But then that wore off, especially when I went to the first uh, international conference down at Slaras, how tribal everybody was. Oh, so it kind of, yeah, I can see how it. And, and I kept saying, I go, you guys are missing the point here. I mean, we're all doing this together. We all need to exchange all the information to make what we're doing better. And we don't 
sliced off by what school you attend or what furnace you're working and compare it to other furnaces and things like that. And as I helped out, like when I helped uh, Deer Hog put together Herman, the same kind of thing happened there. It just got tribal and into the little corners. Mm -hmm. And it made it no fun. Like I said, I I proved that you could do this out in the middle of a field. (laughs) I, I mean, I definitely see that that it is sometimes off-putting a little bit. The competitiveness yeah. can be off-putting. And, and sometimes I get a vibe if I go to a poor, you know, I went to a poor in, in New Mexico, at Iron Tribe. The people that pour down there, like they have their section of that tribe and they don't know me and that's okay. Um, I don't expect to be known everywhere that I, every poor floor I walk onto, but there were some vibes that I don't know if I was reading the situation or misreading the situation, but I kind of felt like, oh, they don't, you know, they they've don't got their know. own little personal, yeah, they, they got the personal thing going over there. <laughs> well, it's also like they don't know my level of expertise, so they don't necessarily know, is she going to walk? in front of an unbodied street. Like, you know, what is, what is the liability of this girl right now? Like, and that's understandable. Um, Well, I mean, that's every time I did a pour, mm -hmm. new people were there. I would make it absolutely go up, you know, introduce myself, you know, that is that what's going on. Okay. What have you done before? What kind of equipment do you have? What experiences do you have? Is there something you would like to do or do you just want to watch? Things like that. And they said they want to watch. I tell them where the restricted areas were and, you know, so that they were at least welcomed to what was going on. Yeah. And that's good. I think that that's the perfect example. That's what we should all do, you know, Mm -hmm. even as a visitor or, you know, a guest at a poor, try and introduce yourself to as many people as possible and, just kind of clear the air so that people know maybe this tribal, like tribal divides maybe won't be so harsh. Right. Right. And and if you have a chance, you just discourage it. It's like, you know, Hey, you're all welcome here. Ask me questions. I'll tell you anything I know. If I don't know it, I can probably show you who to go talk to that does or tell you who to call that does. Mm -hmm. And And that's, that's just, Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that, you know, we do have the student cupola competition, which is, you know, is competitive. I think it's, I don't know, it's hard because a lot of times some of the students coming with their cupola, they maybe don't have as much experience. Sure. Like that might be, they might be coming to a student cupola competition at Sloss and that's their first time at Sloss. Mm-hmm. And so they're immediately thrown into this like competitive arena with their peers, which <laughs> I, I mean, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's all in good fun. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, that's what you, you want to make sure that everybody comes out of there enjoying the time. It doesn't matter if your furnace is a little inadequate or whatever it was, you know, who cares? Mm-hmm. It's it's the thing that you got a furnace, you got it up and running, and you know, and it's always great to come over to somebody who's doing something a little not right, and you kind of go, now why did you do it that way, and see if they can explain it in a way that I would understand it, Mm -hmm. and uh, and instead of telling them that they're wrong when they're wrong, I kind of go, well, you know, you might want to try this, and then point them into the direction that might help them out. But, you know, you, you don't want to sit and criticize anybody. No, because that alienates people. Yeah. I mean, you're just glad that they're there and you got more people involved in doing things. And a lot of times, a lot of people, you know, I mean, how many times a year do you pour iron? Me? Yeah. I will. So I'll tell you, probably twice I will pour it. Yeah. But how many times I go to an iron pour might be six. Okay. But a lot of times I'll go, but I'm the recorder. 
now. I've fallen oh. into this role of filming. So I'm like filming okay. the events. Um, well, then you're a participant. Yeah, you're getting access to different things, different crews. Yeah, that. but I'm I'm at the point right now in my career that I'm not interested in building a cupola. I'm not interested in running an event of my own. I want to go and document what others are doing for, like, for our basically for our history moving forward. So, as right. many different yeah, I mean cupolas that I can document as many different people, as many different programs, as many different conferences, so that we can kind of have a record of how, if they're growing, how they're growing and what, you know, different panels happened and, and different events, different performances, you know? And so it's, it's actually now I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but so there's this one artist who's based out of Denver and mm -hmm. um, they go by the name Sparkles. And I've seen Sparkles do three different wheels, which is a, um, I think it's made out of plywood wheel that kind of looks like a ratchet. Uh, yeah, like a ratchet wheel, not a gear yeah. wheel, like a ratchet wheel or like mm -hmm. a water wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And right. uh, I should talk to them about what the wheel is, the shape is based off of. But anyway, so then there's a full ladle of molten iron that is positioned over the wheel and the wheel is spinning and then they pour the iron on the wheel and it flies up and makes like a beautiful display performance it's very primitive fireworks sort of a thing and and it's very exciting so I have recorded them three different times from 20 mm -hmm. 17 and 2018 until just recently at, at iron tribe. And so that okay. to me is, you know, and people will, there's performance iron can be polarizing to some people. Some people don't like it. Some people love it and it's their jam. Some people think it's a waste of metal. I'm not in any camp besides supporting the artist and what they want to do and capturing. And so I've, you know, recorded, three different performances by the same artist over the past five years. That is my art. Yeah. Okay. Or part, part of it, like part of my artistic practice. And that's just one specific example. So. Well, I know, I mean, people are drawn to it for all kinds of different reasons, mm -hmm. but for me per personally, my path was to try to keep developing the artistic side of it, the aesthetic side of it. Yeah. So let's go and, back to and that. The, and, uh, yeah. And, and the tribal part of it or the crew, the dance, the running of the machine, that can all be inspiring. It can be spiritual. Mm -hmm. It can be all kinds of different things. And it does bring a group of people together, but I usually didn't see anything worthwhile being made. You know, what's the object? You know, it's hard. There is no object. Let's oh, with the performances. Are you talking about with the performances? Well, I mean, when they're even when they're making molds, you know, I'll see things you know, like Coral does some pretty decent stuff. OK. Um, and some name I can't, you know, a lot of the people, the names, I mean, uh, David Little or however you pronounce his name. He made oh, a yeah, couple yeah, of David <laughs> loved I, I've seen a couple pieces of his that look pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but but for the most part, you know, it's either. Well, that could have just been made out of bronze, but they've made it out of iron or that piece doesn't make any sense at all. So, you know, that's where I am in my aesthetic on, on the iron is like, yeah, it's cool. It can be inspiring to do these performances and that type of thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it can be a spiritual thing and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't resolve itself into anything more than I should say it's a glorified bonfire. <laughs> Yeah, to you some. Do, yeah, yeah, you do it. You do it at night, and there's all these sparks and iron flying all over the place, and it does look cool. Yeah, and and I mean, in the same way that similar to you know, on the Fourth of July, if I he I'm in my house and I hear fireworks, I'll go outside and I'll watch them. And right, but yeah, I so I can see how it is that to some people that's the extent of it. It you know, it's. There's many strokes for many folks is one of my favorite kind of sayings that 
just kind of encompasses that. Yeah, like that, that's what I said. There's nothing wrong from, for, yeah. for, but for me personally, it doesn't trip my trigger anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and it hasn't for years, you know, and, and I'm a very fortunate individual where I got access to an industrial foundry. Yeah. You broke in. I, yeah. And I got you snuck to, in under the rug. <laughs> I got to see and learn things, you know, from, you know, metallurgists that can break it down. It takes them two hours to break down a simple thing, but they explain it and they give you kinds of numbers and they give you reasons and it's all the stuff and the equipment that they use and why it's done this way, what the timing was. I think we talked about before we recorded too, is that, you know, like an induction furnace, it's every 20 minutes, just like a cupola or a cupolette. Uh -huh. And it's a timing and that timing works well because it's the time to take, to get the metal poured off and to get the ladles back to the furnace. If they waited longer than that, or sh the metal would be too cold to pour on the floor. Mm -hmm. And they can't pour it any faster <laughs> yeah. to to try to shorten it up to a 10-minute thing and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it just happened to work out. It just syncs up. So there's a lot of things that are some, somewhat similar. It's like I sent you a picture with a bunch of guys out in front of Smith's Foundry. Yeah, yeah. Now, those – and that's the other thing I kind of liked about it. I mean – one third of the foundry um, on average is white. One third of the foundry is, is African-American and one third of the foundry is Hispanic. Okay. And, you know, it takes a while for you to be truly real friends with people that are all at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know? Did you see... Um, that same kind of amount of mix in the time that you were working at that foundry? Was it always like a consistent mix like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now they had several people, but in the time I was there, only white guys were supervisors mm -hmm. and they would always put down the black guys as being incompetent. And then there was one guy who ran one of the automatics. The automatic is a machine where you put a, a pattern board into it. You push a button. The board slides into the machine. Flask comes over top and bottom, cope and drag. Mm -hmm. Blows sand into it. Opens up, slides out on the, on the, on the floor. Boom. Man, they could do this like every 30 seconds or more faster. But they have one Hispanic guy running it. And this guy had gotten a fake social security number and stuff. He was a, an illegal alien. I guess you still call him that. Um, mm -hmm. But the guy who was in charge of that machine always complained about the Hispanics. Oh, God, they shouldn't be here. They're taking our jobs, all that other stuff. Well, he got caught and got sent back over to Mexico. And all of a sudden, this guy's whole philosophy changed. So I really miss him. He was He was my best worker. And I looked at him and I said, uh, hey, um, so you changed your mind about uh, what uh, Hispanic people could do, huh? Was, I miss him. I miss him big time. Yeah. And he, then his attitude changed. He started treating people as equals. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those little things that you, you know, I may have helped affect that. Mm -hmm. Or pointed out what his behavior was like before. Yeah. But, you know, there's all these, that's why I said I could probably talk to you for 10 hours about all these little weird things. But just the, the fact that you could sit inside an industrial place and have carte blanche and do anything you want, you know? Yeah. And I'll go get the bobcat. I'll go get the forklift. You know, I got a, they had a ribbon mixer there at one time. I did Wayne's biggest canoe, his biggest turtle there. Yeah. And Wayne's mold to do that big canoe was 20,000 pounds of sand. Wow. Yeah. That's how much, how much sand did go into that mold. It's the mm -hmm. only time I ever swore at Wayne. <laughs> why did you <laughs> tell me detail for me? Why? Why? Well, because we had a problem. We were pouring it and we had a leak. Oh, 
and I needed to get more iron out of the furnace uh-huh. and go tell the guys to bring me some more iron. And I told Wayne, what I want you to do, I said, I want you to break off this two foot chunk of sand on the top so I could see the, the mold, the canoe mold. Mm-hmm. And I said, and that's where the iron's going to go. Well, Wayne was so nervous. I turned around and I got about 20 feet away from him and he starts following me. <sighs> and, you know, this iron's coming any second. Yeah. And I need that open. They, you know, I'm wasting these guys' time. They got production to do. This isn't production. They're not making any money off of it. Uh-huh. So I swore at him and said, God damn it, Potrats, get back there and do what I told you to do. <laughs> <laughs> and just, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Went yeah. back there. You know, it, it didn't cause any problems, but it was just one of those times where you're, you know, the timing was just really critical. And I had to have that thing opened up. And we got it in there. He had to do some welding on it, which is, Nice industrial gray iron. You can stick weld it if you want. You can't do that with cupel iron. So, what kind of ladle brings the iron from the furnace to the molds? A one-ton ladle. Okay. Kind of, kind of overhead. Mm-hmm. They take a ton out every twenty minutes, mm-hmm. and that comes out into the transfer area, where they have three to four. Ladles that can hold 650 pounds in it. Mm-hmm. And then they fill those up. They they follow the cranes to designated areas where all the moles are mm-hmm. and then pour them off. And then the big ladle goes back to the furnace. 20 minutes later, it comes back out. And then decants into the smaller ones. Yeah, just they keep going back and forth through this thing and it just rocks and rolls. But it, it's, well, I say you one photo where they are, turning the iron into ductile. It's just like for a video. Yeah. And that's the magnesium that they're putting into it. They put the magnesium in the bottom. Mm-hmm. And then when the iron pours, it's the way the ladle's designed, it creates like a spiral in the iron. It's rotating inside the ladle. And that mixes all the magnesium up. And of course, magnesium just fires off. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's one hell of a light show. I took that video and I walked in and Neil Alstrom, the owner, and I, I showed it to him. And he was like, wow. I go, you've never been able to stare at the furnace when this has happened before, have you? He says, no, I didn't know it was that cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd been running the foundry for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So there's, just, there's all these different little pieces of magic that, in a sense, it's, iron is still spiritual for me. Yeah. But in a different way than it is for the folks that are doing the cupolas and the cupolettes. But I think that that's one of the things that makes this, this interview of you very interesting, you know, cause that's one thing that sets your interview apart from pretty much everybody else that I have interviewed and maybe quite a few people that I have yet to interview, you know, we're all doing this art, dance with these homemade smaller I mean not all of them are smaller but it's like you have this experience that is kind of unprecedented and you're still making art in that large foundry arena yes so let's talk a little bit more about you pushing the limits of the iron because that's what we we kind of started talking about that but then I stopped you because I wanted to I wanted to know you know, if you felt like you were missing anything and I'm glad that you said no. And I also kind of knew that I kind of knew the answer before I, I baited you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, you gave me a direction to go, you know, you, well, you, but you I also me- wanted to talk about it because so many people don't see it from that side of the lens or that side of the coin. Well, I mean, and that's one of the reasons that I got interested in wanting to talk to you in the first place, because my path diverged Mm -hmm. from the path that you guys are still on. Yeah. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of openings for white male instructors going on in the the 80s, (laughs) because there was no women in these departments, and they were asking for women and women of color. Mm-hmm. And that's what they should exactly have done and have done now. They're starting to get these numbers equal, if not more women sometimes than men, hopefully, in these departments. But when I went to Kohler, that was one of those 
things that just my mind just blew up. It was like going, ah, this is only going to last three months. I can't have this. Well, then Alex Scott gave me access to his foundry. Mm-hmm. So I could push the limits more. He closed down. Smith opened their doors to me. That gave me boatloads of access to different ways and techniques of doing things, how to handle certain work. You know, it, it, very rarely would I use anything but what they refer to as their regular gray iron. For your own work or for your work and commission? For, for my own work. And rarely I had to use it for anything in a commission, okay. anything different. You know, once in a while I had to use a ductile iron mm-hmm. or something like that. But most of the time, the regular gray iron did everything it needed to do, and it had all the integrity that a cupola iron doesn't have. Mm-hmm. I sent you the def- definition of cast iron art, too. Did you read that? Maybe. I mean, I've been trying to keep up with everything that you've been sending me, but it's been over. I mean, like we started first talking in February. I know. So I just. I'm looking for it right now. Yes, Oops. I got it. Do you want to read it? I don't have it on my screen right now. Okay, you wrote definition of cast there it is. iron. Okay, you you read it. Yeah, a series of discontinuities and blowholes connected by materials of questionable substance and origin. <laughs> Where is this definition from? Well, the metallurgist who is now the head of the foundry, uh, Larry Kramer, some guy in some conference says, this is what people think of cast iron. And he liked it so much, you know, he wrote it down, he put it on his computer, and then he told me the definition of cast iron. I said, you got to make me, you got to get this to me. So he gave me this, to like, a, and put it in a little badge badge form, and we wore it to one conference that was here in town, because they always invite me to the iron conferences when they were held in town here. Mm-hmm. So these iron conferences that you're talking about, are they? Industrial. Industrial cast iron conferences, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> manufacturers, things yep. like that. You know, mm-hmm. you'd have people with for all of the ingredients that they use inside these foundries. So I have a well, I feel like we still haven't finished talking about kind because I want to know some specific ways that you were utilizing the foundry as the artist. Like, but I also I have a I have a side question. Okay. So sure. Um, so then we'll circle back, uh, to more about how you're pushing the boundaries in the, with the access to the industrial. Cause, cause it's like, I can make up in my mind kind of like how you were pushing them, but I want to know like specific ways, specific examples, and like describing maybe some of your pieces for the listeners. Cause a lot of people do listen to the audio only version, like when they're driving or working in their studios. But, but, um, so as I already kind of hinted, I put some videos out on the internet and, um, I will put that we use brake rotors. So I'll say, oh, this is a cast iron skillet made from recycled brake rotors. And that's like my Mm -hmm. biggest hit video. And I get a lot of comments about people, you know, whoever around the world, uh, keyboard trolls, they'll say that the, uh, cast iron skillets are not suitable to be cooked in because the lead in the cast iron brake rotors or the asbestos from the brake pads is in the iron. No, it's not. Okay. Lead and cast iron hate each other. Okay. You get lead inside cast iron, and it ruins the whole batch. Oh, okay. So, so that's that's the big no no of no nos of foundries <laughs> that are doing cast iron. So, like, if I get a stack of brake rotors from like the local brake shop, is there any lead in that iron brake rotor? No, because the integrity of the brake the brake rotor would not meet industry standards cool. it would it cool, cool, cool. yeah so there is no lead lead and cast iron do not mix never mix and never shall mix okay anything that's thrown into a, a furnace let's say you throw uh, asbestos into a furnace okay 
it floats to the top and we slag it off because we want the iron to iron to be we want iron to be pure. Yeah, this is what I I suspected, and and I also suspect that sometimes people writing these comments, you know, don't actually know what they're talking about, but they're so, uh, they're so like convincing. <laughs> Like, it's just so funny because it's it's just so funny because people will write comments like you should never cook in that because you're going to get lead poisoning. And I'll say, oh, you obviously didn't watch the whole video because I say at the end, this is just for decoration because it's got my wedding date on it. <laughs> but now you could clarify it saying nobody who casts iron would let lead get within 100 miles of their furnace because it ru it ruins the iron. Mm -hmm. I mean that happened once at Smith. Okay. And they had to, they had to dump eight tons of oh iron. Oh my god! They had to reline their furnace because all of a sudden lead showed up in the spectrograph, oh. and everybody's red flags went up. Says shit, stop boring. Yeah. And then they had to figure out where that lead came from. Mm -hmm. And the ab asbestos yeah. is just gonna float to the top and get slagged off. Like, I mean, and so this wasn't yeah. stuff that I was worried about, but it was stuff that I just didn't know where to find the, like, I, I mean, I didn't really care that much because that's the thing about commenters. It's like, they're never gonna, they're never gonna believe me anyway. So there's no, yeah. I mean, most of the time it's not going to make anything, but right. I mean, as you do more and more of these things, the more you find out about what the iron is, what happens with it, uh, what's really inside of it you know, that type of stuff. Um, you kind of know, and it's, it's iron. There's no lead in here unless some idiot stuck a lead pipe in there. But even at that point, it's not enough lead to contaminate a frying pan to make it unhealthy. Yeah. Cause otherwise your iron would, it would, you wouldn't even be able to recognize it as iron if it had that enough lead to do that much damage in there. But iron is just iron. Mm -hmm. No iron is cast with lead because it's, no good for it. So you can always feel safe with <clears throat> if you want to use it as a fry pan. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't ever planning on it, but it, sometimes it's like, I wish that I, I wished that I would know the answer. And so now I do. Thank you for humoring me, <laughs> humoring me. Yeah. That, that. I mean, but th these are the questions that somebody might have or something. Hey, there's, I heard there's lead in the iron. Well, there isn't. And by the way, you, you can't even buy asbestos anymore. Well, the brake pad are the brake pads aren't asbestos anymore. I don't know if the brake pads are asbestos. I don't think they are. That's what the people were worried about. Was and I like maybe I, in a maybe in a foreign country they are, but in the United States, asbestos on a brake pad would get airborne. Yes, that's a good point. And that becomes a hazard. Because, I mean, all of those cars, I, that's a really good point. Do we think that all of the cars are just derived? Anyways, I. Yeah. And the other I, thing, if you're if you're a person who works at a, a service station that changes brakes. Yeah. What's it? That's going to kill them. Right. So there is no asbestos in brake pads. Most of those pads are a ceramic concoction of something. Yeah. But that's not going to like penetrate are. into the iron enough to, I just, I, I just. No, I mean, that's why the brake pads wear out. And if the brake pads wear out and you don't change them, that's when you ruin your drake mm -hmm. drums. It's because now you got metal to metal yeah. contact and that's scraping away the metal on the brake drum. Wild. All right. Thanks for humoring my little question about that. But yeah, so I, I'm interested. No, no, they're, those are, they're, they're really good questions. There's not a, there's no stupid questions in, in, in iron. <laughs> well, cause it's funny because I'll post like that video and then these comments will come. I will get, I got one comment, John, somebody was said, well, that car part, those car parts are actually made. How did he say it? He said, those car parts are made out of steel. So what you have is a steel frying pan. And no, they aren't because steel, steel, can, I know a uh, cupola know. cannot heat, melt steel. Dude, I know. And so what I responded, I just wrote, wow. And that's it. That's all I wrote. 
So if people believe him, they think I'm saying. I'm, yeah, I'm going to make no attempt to right, correct you. So far out of scope. And so if somebody believes him, they'll think I'm saying, wow, thank you for informing me. But if they know, like I know, like this, you know, then they'll get it. They'll get the joke. Right. And it's like the, the steel that's, yeah, the steel that Smith uses inside their mm-hmm. furnace is, you know, it's like a, a one gallon bucket that's about a third filled up with steel slugs. So these are punchings. Uh huh. And the company they get it from knows what type of steel Smith Foundry wants and only that type of steel to make sure their furnace formula is absolutely correct. Because once again, they're a job shop. And when these patterns come in or they order some of the stuff of the patterns that they hold down there, they can guarantee that customer that we are giving you the right kind of iron for the product you want. And they go and they, they prove it with all the tests they do and they boxes and boxes of stuff they keep. To, there's one time a wheel broke on a roller coaster at Disneyland or Disney World. Okay. And there was a big lawsuit over it. And, of course, they named Smith as part of the lawsuit because we had made that wheel for um, that particular company, w- which went on that particular roller coaster. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And so they keep their records for seven years at Smith. That's as long as they need to keep them. And so we just they just went back through the boxes and said, well, here's a sample from, that was tap 13, tap 13, here's the bar sample, here's da 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 And they sent that in to the lawyers, and the lawyers said, thank you very much. Uh, you are You have been dismissed from our lawsuit. Wow. They saved, they covered their butts? covered their butts. So what other types of things did the Smith Foundry or does the Smith Foundry cast? They make hundreds of mm-hmm. items. Can you give me some examples? Well, they make uh blower motor housings, uh they make stuff for Thermal King that goes in the refrigerator units on top of semis. Um they make a giant brake pad. Uh-huh. And I don't know what, because I got tired of asking them what these parts were or what they went to, because they would sit there and say, John, it's just a job. We don't know. Yeah, I can relate to that. Because I think at one time they had, I think right now they probably have over 6,000 pattern boards sitting in that place. I saw, actually, there's a picture of you in front of, in front of that, or is that? Right. That pitch. That picture is of me, and I'm holding, there's a little white thing in my hand that's got a handle on it. They use that to pour into all the test bars and blocks. And that holds about six pounds of iron. And I had really tiny molds sitting on the floor. Some of the things I did for my last pieces, because 650-pound pot is pretty hard to pour a mold that needs four pounds or three pounds of iron. So they bring the big pot over there. I put the ladle out. They fill my ladle up, fill my mold, refill my ladle, fill, do the next mold, <laughs> next mold, next mold, next mold. So that's a lot of those things. The last pieces I did, I did with that ladle. So all those boards that are behind you are just... Those are, those are pattern boards for the automatic machines. They have three automatics in that foundry. And then they got a giant muller that mulls up the green sand. And then... When that batch of sand is done, bottom of the molar opens up and it dumps into a hopper. The hopper seals itself. They pressurize it and they blow the sand through pipes to the three machines. So it's, it gets there by air pressure. Wow. <laughs> and then does that air pressure yeah. adequately tamp it down? I like I'm. Yeah, the air pressure. Uh, all the machines have a big hopper on top of them. And so when they order sand to that whatever machine, it automatically fills it up to the top and there's a little mechanism there to let let them know that that's all the sand they need. And then the valve shuts and another machine can get sand in. And then it doesn't need to be rammed at all because it that is the firmness that the sand needs. It's all, it's, it's all done by air pressure. So when they make the mold, sand is sitting on top of there. They pressurize the sand and it goes... 
poof, and you can hear the big pressure and air come through there. And then it vibrates, and the cope and drag flask disappears into the machine and under the machine. Panabore slides out. They lower the top and bottom together, and another ram pushes it out onto the floor. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really something to see. It sounds amazing. It really does. I mean, I've seen, I've been lucky enough to go on two different um, industrial foundry tours. One was in Memphis and one was in Granite City, Illinois. And um, yeah, just seeing the production line of the mold making was just like mind blowing. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, that's where, that's where the magic I mean, there's magic in all di- different, but I can see how then it's like, well, if you're working there as an employee day to day to day and you aren't doing anything artistic, I can see how they'd be like, it's just a job. We just have to get these filled. I don't know what it's going to. That's right. And that's one of the things that, you know, like the owner was interviewed, he, he was interviewed several times by TVs and radios and newspapers and stuff about things that I was doing around the foundry and He'd say, he says, John does it from the beginning of the idea all the way through to the finished casting. And he says, it makes what we do here make sense to the employees. And they like to see the process from start to finish. Yeah. And that became a thing when I, when students would bring their molds in, you know, the guys kept started gathering around. What's in there? What's this one about? What's that one about? And the students would tell them a little bit about what they were making. And then the iron would come. They'd pour the molds. And they're like, we got to see what's in here. And, of course, they're going, well, we have to wait like an hour before we can open. And he goes, hell no. <laughs> they just kick the mold and break them open for them because yeah. it only takes a couple minutes for it to get hard unless it's really thick piece. Okay. So they knew. They were like, you don't have to wait. Yeah. And then they just use their steel toe shoes and kick them open. <laughs> now, one guy, a woman, uh, a woman was, did uh, molds of her breasts uh-huh. and had them in there. And one of the guys, he, he's kicking some of her stuff open. All of a sudden, he kicks the thing open with, with the breasts, and he, it was upside down, and he kicked it over so he could see what's there. And he leans down, and he goes, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he just runs away. <laughs> you should have warned me those were breasts in there. <laughs> But it was the thing, it really would lighten up their, their day because, you know, they're pushing buttons and doing just simple things all day long. Yeah. And then you bring things in where it's like, whoa, well, now this is really kind of cool. So, you know, they used to have derogatory names for me all the time when I first was there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's one of those things where they, they, they see you do all the hard work. And that you can do exactly what they do, but you're making these different kinds of objects and things like that. And so, you know, they they slowly warmed to me. So when a new employee came in, they said, oh, there's this artist here. You know, you'll have to meet him and stuff like that. And they'd bring the new guy up and say, hey, I wonder if you uh, to so-and-so. You know, I'd shake their hand and do da 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 He goes, I hear you do some cool things. I says, well, I'll let you know the next time I'm up to something, Okay. All right. Then, you know, next time something interesting came, I made sure, you know, I invited him to come and see what we were doing. It's probably also really rewarding for the foundry workers in the industrial foundry to see the difference that they make in the students' lives or, you know, in the artists' lives. Right. Because all the, you know, they get done pouring the molds and all the students would give them a standing ovation, clap, yays, you know. What's your name? Say, hey, you're the best. You're the best. You're the yeah. best. So they, they were getting all these accolades that they don't get the rest of the time they're there. <laughs> yeah, the rest of the time it's just like, oh, it's 20 minutes. We got to go back. <laughs> right. It's a good partnership. It's a really good partnership. Yes, it, re- it really was. And like you said, you know, you were talking about my artwork and stuff, but the last group of stuff, and I'll send you some more pictures of it. That That's kind of the culmination where I could make these piece molds I could shape them any way I wanted to. I could get the language in the way I wanted it to go. And what, you know, was really surprising to me is when I started placing them next to each other, 
I looked over and it was a surprise is that that was telling way more of the story than I ever thought the one piece was going to tell. And so then I just found the right groupings of the right pieces and that's what just made the whole thing work. So the satisfaction, you know, that's my satisfaction is that I actually made the work that I intended to set out years ago to make. I finally made it that I personally am totally satisfied with what I did. And I feel like that's the most important thing. Right. And that, that was my mission. Yeah. Uh, we, we should talk about what you got hot on the horizon. Well, for me, everything comes in a spurt. Mm-hmm. Even when I'm doing castings, all of a sudden I make a series of castings and I stand back and I kind of go, all right, I think I've exhausted this type of work. And sometimes it might take me a year before I hit on the next thing I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, one time I took about a pretty much a five-year break from doing my stuff because I played my guitar. <laughs> mm-hmm. Formed a band, you know? I feel cool. like that's really important for listeners to hear because especially students and, I, you know, when we first started talking and trying to figure out how I was going to, how, how we were going to get you interviewed. Um, you asked me if I was a student and I'm not, but I am not so far away right. from my student career that I've forgotten what it was like. And I remember thinking that, uh, a year was a really long time. <laughs> And, and now that I'm a little bit older and out of school of longer, I realize like I can go six months without making any work and, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Whereas when I was in school, I thought if I don't make work for two months, I'm dead in the water. And that's not, I think it's important. Well, yeah, you got deadlines, you got classes to complete, you got all these different yeah. things to do. And the other thing, you know, you always tell a student is that this is the last time in your life you're going to have this much time to do your artwork. Yes. Now it's going to go down to less, less than 10% of your waking time will be making artwork. Yeah. Even if you're hired to make it, it (laughs) changes. Yeah. So that's why I always say, you know, to people, it's like, if you hit on something great, but you still need to learn the craft of what you're going to do. Yeah. Cause that way I could, you know, I can walk into a foundry. I can whip out 20 molds in two hours. Mm Mm-hmm finished, ready to go. It's like, that's great. 20 moles is a lot of castings. <laughs> yeah. And you could just get yourself in the flow of the process where, you know, it's, it's like when they say uh, like a baseball players, you know, they figured out what's going on. They've got a 20 game hitting streak going, you know, they're in the zone. You're just in this zone where you're just doing this stuff. And then, you know, for me, it's always good to take a step back, mm-hmm. to look at it, to absorb it, because that's how, even if I go to a museum, the first time I go to the museum, I walk through it really, really fast, mm-hmm. because I have to think about what I saw. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, I'll go back, and I'll look at all this stuff again, and I'll stop at a few things, mm-hmm. and they'll start giving me information. Mm-hmm. Then another week goes by. And now I know exactly what pieces I want to go back and really see. Yeah. And that's how, that's how I work with my head when other people are, are different. I know that, but personally that's how it works, works for me. But I bet a lot of people can relate to that too, because I definitely, I, I with these interviews, you know, I, I go through the interview and I'm myself experiencing the interview, but then when I go through and edit the interview, I absorb way more information because I can actually sit. I don't have to be formulating what question I am going to ask next or what's my reaction or do I actually understand this concept? Like I can really, and so that kind of repetition, I can see applying that to viewing artwork and being inspired by different aspects of the world. You know, this kind of repetition of exposure. Yeah. But that's, that's what it, that's what it is. That's why I could take that time away. Just, you know, my kids got old enough where, you know, I'm like going, well, old enough. I'm just going to go get 
get a guitar and I got a Les Paul. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go get some amps. I got a Marshall. Mm-hmm. And I went down. All of a sudden, this music started pouring out of me. Yeah. And then I got a bass player. Then I got mm-hmm. a drummer. Mm-hmm. Then I got a lead singer. And, you know, it was like every we meet every Sunday and everybody would show up. And I go, okay, here's the new tune I just came up with. And about 90% of the time, they wanted to do the tune and wanted to get it all going and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they go, no, I just go back to another, the stuff we were doing. <laughs> yeah. And I, as a, as an interviewer, I can see a, a full circle in that when you were in your early years, you were very into music and you would do a lot of yeah. drawings of musicians. Right, right. And, I, you know, that's the other thing about Doug Henderson back at Drake. Um, he had a class, a drawing class. So I signed up for his drawing class. I had other, had other classes from other teachers in drawing and things like that. And his class was at night. So, okay, cool. So we went there. So the first day he introduced what we were going to do and stuff like that. And he says, now, I have something I call draw to you puke. Okay, go on. And we're gonna do we're gonna do we're gonna do that on a Saturday night. I want you to bring everything you want to draw to the class, and we're gonna spend four hours drawing all this stuff so we can get that shit out of your mind, so you can actually start focusing in on making art. Okay. And it was a great idea, and I did that, and. You know, it's like, yeah, I've already done all this stuff and I've already done all that stuff. And it did. It got it got the crap out of my mind. And like I said, it's a liberal art school. They're trying to teach you how to think. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes like with Wayne's classes, somebody come in, first time student, and they say, yeah, I want to make a bust of my mother. She's dying. And I'm like, well, have fun. Well, can't you show me how to do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and their expectations are wrong where you're you're locked into something and your mind's closed off to what it should really be seeing. Yeah. We had that we had that at, well so my um degrees in my academic de- degrees are actually in metalsmithing and jewelry making. And so okay. I saw that a lot in that people would want to make something from the Lord of the Rings. They'd want to make something like a copy of a prop basically. And so right. uh, mostly just in the intro classes and stuff. And, but that was always, cause then when I was a graduate student, I taught the intro classes. And so having to try and coerce people to get away from copying something that another artistic person already, you know, it's like somebody already made that we want to. Right. Well, the thing, that, that's where the cleverness of coming up with the assignment is. Yeah. To, to force them to grow. So if you want to make that Lord of the Rings thing, great. Have a good time. Yeah. Um, but here's our first assignment, is, and here's the, con- the concept. I've laid out the concept. You know, you don't tell them what to do. You lay out a concept. I'd like you to work with X amount of elements or things or something along this idea that you make sure it's not stretching itself into movie art or yeah. sword art or anything else like that and hopefully that starts opening that mind and say in the meantime if you wish to dabble in that other thing go ahead and do it just make sure you have my assignment done on this date yeah exactly yeah right um so let's see let's get back to you though because i keep i feel like i keep finding ways to make this about me but let's see so we were talking about so I feel like that what we were talking about where you were taking we're taking some time to play in a band and make music. I like I think that that's something that um for younger artists to realize that we have our whole lives for our creative practice. Well, you really do. And you know the vast amount of people who go to school for art are going to struggle to make a living at it. Yeah. Or they're going to have to come up with some kitschy kind of an object to make to sell at some fair or something like that. 
And so, yeah, like a bread and butter. Yeah. And so, you know, the way I approach it, because I wasn't teaching, mm-hmm. is that um, I would take a challenging job if it was offered. You know, I made uh, three-dimensional billboards for about, on and off for about four or five years. Mm-hmm. I mean, these things are 120 feet long, 30 feet high. And you're making these three-dimensional crazy objects. You know, it's not art. But the objects and materials I had to use was like opened other doors to how I could make patterns, what materials I could use. Yeah. I'll let it. And it paid really well. Mm-hmm. You know, there was another thing. I had a friend who had a remodeling company. Every once in a while, he needed some help with a kitchen or a bathroom or an addition. You know, so you take a few weeks off. You come home with, you know, $5,000. And I'm good to go. And, and back in the 80s, $5,000 in a couple of weeks, oh, hell, of a, it's like $10,000 today. Yeah. You know, I had, my son used to call them the Humpty Dumpty Projects. I had a call from um, North High School. And they said, oh, our Abraham Lincoln is broken. Uh, We think it's bronze. I said, okay, I'll come down and take a look at it. Well, it was plaster. Full-size Abraham Lincoln. Okay. (laughs) Of course, of course it was plaster. It must have been in 500 pieces. Oh, my gosh. You know, and I'm looking at it and said, okay, I'll, I'll get back to you on this one. And I, I actually called Potrats. I said, Wayne, how do you glue plaster back together? Yeah. Well, as far as I know, you can't do that. <laughs> I said, really? And so then I remembered the materials I was working with in the billboard place. Yeah. And it's expandable foam. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so what I did is I made an armature out of wood and steel inside the piece with other stuff sticking out. You know, it's a big, complicated armature. And then what I did is I, let's say I put his left leg together right up to where the butt is. Okay. Then I mix up just the right amount of (laughs) foam, pour it in there. Okay. And all that foam would stick to the plaster. Great. Permanently stick to it. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't budget at all. Okay. And my son, when I brought it back, he called it and goes, oh, it looks like a Humpty Dumpty project, Dad. Mm-hmm. So, but I ended up putting this whole thing together and getting the paint to look like it was from 19, because this thing was from like 1910. Yeah. Okay. But put it all back together. But I mean, that paid a boatload of money. But once again, it's a challenge. Yeah. Now, how do how do I do this? That Wayne says you can't do this. So mm-hmm. let's see if I can figure it out. And well, then you figured it out. Okay, I figured that one out. But I had several projects that people would call me, and they were just the oddest things. And I'd take them because they were challenging. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason I never had a full time job is I get bored. <laughs> you know, if I t- if I took a job at some company. I might like it for two weeks, but by the time two months is done, I'm not even interested in showing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's no challenge to the job. Because you've you've lived through that honeymoon period, right? Right. I already figured everything out, so now everything's just blah 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 the same. So that that because of that's in my, built into my personality. That's why I say that's why no one's. I haven't had a you know. I haven't been hired by anybody on a permanent basis in 40 plus years. And I just go and things come and I get calls. It's like, Oh, I do, I do special insurance projects. Um, I've been looking for somebody who could fix a cast iron sculpture for two and a half years. And I, and I told him my address and he goes, my office is less than a mile from your house. And I've been looking for two and a half years. <laughs> but I mean, that project paid. It took me, I think I spent less than 10 hours putting it all back together. It was, it was a big, huge column uh, for a place out at in an expensive neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And I spent 10 hours and I got $12,000 to do it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's pretty good. good. But it's specialized work. I mean, it took them that long to find you. Well, I mean, and that's this will kind of justify it. You know, there's there's the old joke about when somebody knows what they're doing. It's like it kind of goes, uh, oh, this furnace broke at this factory. I need to get the furnace up and running again because it's the middle of winter. And I said, we've called everybody and they all say we have to tear it out. It's going to cost us a $2 million to put a new one in, stuff like that. And your name came up and they said, you're retired, but you know how to fix it. And he says, well, why don't I come out and take a look at it? Um, if I fix it, it's going to be a million dollars. Yeah. Fine. We'll pay you the million dollars. So the guy goes out there, pulls out his pipe wrench goes clink, 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 clink. And he turns the valve halfway. I says, turn it on. Turns on, the furnace works. And of course, <laughs> the people sitting there, we're not paying you a million dollars. You're not paying me for my labor. You're paying me for my experience mm -hmm. type of deal. So, yeah. That's just a longer version of what you had said to me. That's a good one. That's a good story. Or, well, yeah. like that's a good anecdote. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's true. And the more experience we get, the more valuable we are. That's right. And, and, and for me, the stranger the projects become. Because the word of mouth stuff kind of gets out. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people would call me and say, you know, there's this guy in Minnesota he does something with a foundry down there, but I don't know the name of the foundry. And then they start calling all the foundries in Minneapolis, and finally they get a hold of Smith, and they say, yeah, I know this guy. Here's his phone number. Or they say, there's this guy that does stuff like that that hangs around Smith Foundry. And then they give him Smith Foundry's number, and boom, I get a phone call, and it's just another bizarre project. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking oh, about. I heard um, a click. I heard a click and I thought maybe we got oh, disconnected. No, I think I hit the microphone. Um, well, I think that this would be a good time for us to go on over to the after show. Okey oh, wait, did you talk? Did we say advice? Did you give advice? I mean, we already talked about a little bit of advice. My advice is learn your craft. Don't be don't be bullheaded enough not to see when the when your path diverges. Go down a different path if it looks interesting and explore what's there. You don't have to make art 24-7. You don't have to be an art teacher to make art. You just want to follow your muse to see where it leads you. Keep learning new things because if you don't learn something every day, you're wasting our mankind's time, woman's kind time. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where you should keep going. And trust yourself, like you said, about playing music. Well, I took about five years. I had a ball, mm -hmm. but it really got my emotions going. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that once again, translated back into the work I started making again. That's all really good advice. And it actually really hit me in the sensitive spot because I kind of, I feel, I feel like uh, going this weird way and doing this podcast and focusing on the videography of these iron events is not something mm -hmm. that I would have done, thought about doing, you know. Right, you fe you fell into it. Yeah. And I, f I saw that there was a hole. Yeah. That was the thing. Right, and I fell into being in industrial foundries because there was a hole that filled that hole mm -hmm. for me personally. Yeah. But it's not every, not every path would go in the way I went to. And one reason why I wanted to talk to you is because my path in cast iron is different than a lot of other people's experience with it. But it shows that this is a possibility or a kind of relationship like you had with these different foundries as an artist in residence. But it's like you, you had to seek that out. You had to, you know, search it and find places that would support you and your endeavors and, you know, it's like they're not putting out calls is what I'm hearing is that these foundries aren't putting out calls, but that doesn't mean that others can't come after you and, and follow in that type of a footstep. I got lucky with going to Smith mm -hmm. and I got lucky that Atwater Foundry was mad at their employees for going on strike. 
those two key things opened doors for me into the industrial world. Mm -hmm. But I also tell other people, it's like, let's say there's a foundry near you that does iron and you want to do iron. Well, you certainly can work out a deal with them to bring molds to get them poured so that you can do it more consistently. You can get better iron so that you can explore how you can make that object in a way that you're not afraid it's going to fall apart or it's going to freeze and stuff like that. Because you're actually getting iron that comes out at 2,800 degrees. <laughs> yeah. And it's consistent all the time. So, I mean, there, and you can do it with other industries too. It's like I said, you don't walk in the door and say, I'm an artist. You walk in the door and say, I've got this project. Maybe you can help me with it. And then you say, I, I got to make some molds. I know how to do molds and stuff like that, but I just need a couple of them poured. Would you do it for me? And that's how you break the ice mm -hmm. and crack that door open. And if you do a good job with your molds and pouring and you're nice to the people who are doing it with you, especially the workers, it could open that avenue so that you could get even more access to either a foundry, fabrication shop, whatever it happens to be. And it doesn't have to be the end of going to these iron pour conferences and events too. That was just something that like, stuck in my mind is it's like, you can still do that too. I mean, I've the past three iron pours that I've gone to, I haven't brought any molds because mm -hmm. it's really more about seeing the people like networking and meeting my, seeing my old friends and stuff. So like the, cause I have so many unfinished castings. Yeah. But, but so it's like, you're not, yeah. But I mean, it, it, it's something you might, you, you might get back to it, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. not, not on your priority. But I think that that might be a great resource because sometimes going to a conference and having to worry about your mold. That's no fun. It's like, well, you just want to be there and experience the event. And so it's like, there could be a duality in both of the kind of realms the conference and iron pour, you know, small, more intimate. Right. You're keeping and, yourself, yeah. you're keeping yourself in touch with the iron community and what yeah. they're doing. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have a real job that's fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so you, you got, you got the best of both worlds. I would say my job is fun sometimes. Okay. Well, it's, it's not like it's, it, it sounds like an interesting job. Let's put it that way. But at the same time, right now, what you're doing with <laughs> these, these uh, pods, mm -hmm. podcasts, is you're generating a wealth of information from individuals that are doing it currently, that are new to it, that have been around forever, like Wayne. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, all that kind of stuff brings perspective into what others that are working with it may end up doing with it. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you could you know, you could do technical answers, you can do all this different stuff, but you're getting bits and pieces of all that stuff all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> and I really hope that I mean one of the advice uh tidbits that I got was from one person was to know your know your history. And so this is kind of my way of helping my generation and the generations to come after me for us to know our history, to be able to hear your stories about the first Sloss conference. That's why I always say I'm the person in the background when it comes to cast iron. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm, I'm there for the people that I've met and know or get introduced to me to talk about what I do with it, how I do things with it, or if I can help them and that, that type of things. I mean, I can help Wayne because he wasn't sure how to make an iron mold that big for his canoe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, I think I can do that. I'm just going to blow up what I've done in the past. Um, but, you know, as far as, you know, seeing me at a conference or other things like that, none of the new people have seen me. Mm -hmm. So offering this other path, I thought, you know, could be at least interesting, if not helpful. I think it's definitely been both for me. And I think for good everybody. So, well, let's go on over to the after show. Okay. Um, do you have any, can we tease um, 
like any of your favorite stories? Do you have anything that you've been thinking about maybe talking about in the after show? No, the one story I told you about, we have to bleep it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure that we'll was... find something to talk about when we're over there. Yeah. I mean, like any funny stories from Iron Pores, either early Iron Pores or like if you've ever seen a furnace fail or if you like a big mold fail that you, well, I guess you already told the story about Wayne's canoe, big canoe mold. Well, we were doing a bronze thing. I could talk about that one. Okay. At the Smith This is, this is one where, where Potrats just disappeared from thin air and it peered over about 50 to 100 feet away from us. Oh, okay. And, and he thought his life was over. Oh, okay. Yeah, I definitely want to hear that story. Okay, so, I, John, I want to officially say thank you so much for letting me interview you, for contacting me and reaching out and letting me know what you had to offer. And, and it definitely, you showed up with the, all of that and, and much more. And I'm inspired hearing your story of how you kind of braved and pa braved the pathway into these industrial foundries and kind of showed us, ex especially with the Kohler, because the Kohler foundry is still going, the Kohler foundry yeah. re residence is still going on. Right. And it's a great thing if you can get into it yeah. because you're there for a limited amount of time mm -hmm. and you can see whether all of a sudden you become introduced to what you can actually do in an industrial foundry. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say thank you and we'll just say goodbye to the public audience for now. Hopefully they come on over to the after show. If they're a member of Patreon, then we're going to keep the conversation going over there. But if you're now they have, to, they have to be a member of what? Of Patreon. How do you spell that? P A T R I O N. Wow. Oh, and you just type that into your search box. Mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. takes... So okay. it's it's just a website that um I'm doing an advertisement for you. Oh, oh, oh you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so basically like I do this because of the love of the game and because I want to capture everybody's stories and get the stories out to more people, but also I'm genuinely interested in meeting as many people as I can. And so this is kind yeah. of my way to, you know, fulfill my dream, but um, it does cost me money. It does cost yes, me. It and, does. and you and I have talked about this a little bit before we started recording. Right. It, it does cost me money to get these things on Spotify and Apple iTunes and for all the people that listen that way. And, you know, it takes me about 15 13 to 15 hours per episode, not including, right, right. It, not it, including you know, the, how long we you talking. Well, it, it, and for me, the nice thing was we've had a couple times to chat before we did this. Yeah. yeah. And that sort of, that sort of um, brought back a few more memories and a few more things to think about instead of saying, I'm going to do this on X amount of day. And all of a sudden you start the interview and you're going, Oh yeah. Well, how did that go again? <laughs> So it did, it did throw a few of those things back in my mind and got me thinking about stuff. Because, I mean, I haven't thought about the past in a long time. Yeah. Well, that's good for me to hear. I mean, that's good. Because it's like I don't always get feedback about that. But so, well, so for people that are listening, you know, John and I have been troubleshooting our connectivity. And the first time we tried to, the first time we tried to record the episode, the internet was so bad. And so yeah. then we, we did another trial run. And so... Basically, yeah, I was trying to get to know you a little bit, get a feel for your personality and stuff. And so we'd talk a little bit about iron and cast iron art, but then I'd say, Don't but don't tell me the whole story because are you I know you can't cut me off. No, no, that's a wait on I that know. one. Like I don't want to like the Cranbrook like the Cranbrook cannon. I sent you a picture of that too. Was it after the Jay Hooley cast iron? Oh yes. Dang. Yeah, there it is. Historic cast iron, but I figured that was just going to prompt you into asking the people that actually know what that thing is and what it did. 
Yeah. This is a great story. Oh, and that's the other thing. I got sites on Facebook for uh, historic cast iron. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So, yeah, so tell everybody. It's Yeah, it's it's and my site's public, so anybody could go on the site. Okay, so um, this is, John's talking about on Facebook. You can go on well, you go you go to my pa- go to my page, or you could just type in "historic cast iron art" and it'll take you to the page I put up. Um, but that just has all kinds of pictures from the past, uh, you know, paintings of foundries, objects made in foundries, all kinds of different stuff like that. And the vast ninety nine percent of it is all dealing with with iron. And the other side I have is just called cast iron art. And that's a, I found out that was private and I can't change it to public. But what I've been trying to do, and it's been really hard to kind of do it, is to get either people to post their cast iron object to it, or sometimes I just screen grab things when I find them and I just put them on there and they're all things made from or having to do with cast iron. And I don't, I always delete any advertisements you put on there. Like if you're advertising for an iron board, I'm going to delete it. <laughs> I just want, you know, his, historic photos of iron stuff or objects you've made incorporating cast iron. And I won't edit those if they get on there. And that's a good resource to get inspiration and see what we're coming from and where we're, where we are now. Right. And, you know, I, I got pictures of like, there's this great big tree. It must be five stories tall on a side of it looks like a church window. It's all cast iron. I don't know who made it, but it's gorgeous. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go on over to the after show again. Thank you so much, John, for being on the show today. Well, thank you for uh, being so nice with me. <laughs> well, it's not that hard. You're pretty nice. So, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's go on over to the after show. So everybody that's listening and watching, thanks so much for tuning in. We hope to see you in the after show. Um, but thanks for listening. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. This conversation doesn't have to end here. To gain access to the after show where John and I continue our discussion, visit the website patreon.com slash the podcast iron. Their supporters at any level get access to the after show recordings from each episode that's ever been published. And so if you don't know, the after show is just an extra 15 to 20 minutes with the show's guest, sometimes more, (laughs) where we talk a little more candidly and share at least one more story behind the privacy of a paywall. And in the after show from this episode, John tells me a harrowing story of Wayne Potratz and the spilling of a ladle full of bronze, among other interesting stories. So yes, if you sign up now, you'll get access to listen to John's after show, as well as all of the after shows with all of the earlier guests. And if you like what I'm doing with this project and you want to support the show, this is the best way to do it. For as little as a dollar a month, I mean, you can contribute more, but Just a dollar really makes a difference in going to subsidize the costs that I undertake to make this resource publicly available for you and uh, and you get the after show. So it's a win-win for everyone. Well, in conclusion of this public portion of the episode, I think we can learn a lot from John's story. And it just goes to show that if you ask the right people for what you want, you can gain that and more resources and experience than you ever thought was possible. So you might as well just ask. John, thank you so much for sharing your story and so many details of your involvement with iron and foundry work. I truly enjoyed hearing your story and getting to know you through this interview, and I know many of our other community members will as well. The way that you were able to form symbiotic relationships with industrial foundries is very interesting and will be inspirational to the right people when the time comes. And now, thank you to our top supporters for helping me afford the production costs of this show. Thank you, Sloss Metal Arts, for doing such a great job hosting the National Conference last month. And by extension, thank you to all of the committee members from the NCCCIAP. You guys rocked it. And I know that sometimes it seemed like a thankless job, but we all love you and thank you so much. And we think you did a great job. And thank you to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance for being a top supporter of the show. I'm so honored and encouraged to have your backing 
And thank you for all of the work that you do in the service of the Western region of the U.S. and its cast iron artists. So yes, thank you to the Western Cast Iron Art Alliance and Sloss Metal Arts for supporting the show, as well as all of our other individual supporters on Patreon. The funds that they contribute are invaluable to help me to continue to produce these episodes. But if you don't have it in your budget to support the podcast Iron on Patreon, that's okay. Instead, please share this podcast with someone you think would be interesting in listening or watching, and I'll appreciate that just as much. Anything and everything helps, and from that I say, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And one more thing that I want to mention before signing off is, well, we've made it to our one-year anniversary. That's right, folks. The podcast iron is one year old, and I'm exhausted. For the first six months, I released an episode every single week. And then the second half of the year, I released episodes every other week, but that was still two episodes a month. When I started this project, I didn't think that each episode would take as much time as it does to produce. So it's about 15 hours per episode. And I I don't know. I also hoped that maybe I would get enough funding from the community that we could afford a professional editor to edit the episodes together. But it turns out that Uh, after pricing that out, it's more expensive than I thought, and we're maybe one-tenth of the way to that goal. So in an effort to regain my sanity and my artistic practice, the podcast Iron will now be a monthly show. I will release a new episode on the second Friday of each month, and thank you to everyone, Patreon members and individual sponsors who support the show and the work that I do to produce it. Stay tuned because I really do have some great interviews coming up, some of which are already performed, the interview, but I just have to complete the editing. But seriously, truly, this project is my labor of love and part of my contribution to the movement. I'm not going to stop. I just need it to be a little bit more sustainable in conjunction with my day job and my art making practice. So if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at thepodcastiron at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening and watching. I'm sending you all my love always, and I can't wait to share the next episode with you. I'll talk to you soon, and have a great day.